Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Braden and City Council meeting, Wednesday, April 10th, 2024, at 8.30 a.m. here in our City Council chambers. At this time, we'll ask Pastor Don Steriano with Kingdom Life Church to come forward, give us our invocation, and then we'll do the pledge. Everyone, please stand. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You bow your heads, please. Number 624, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, this morning I just declare this over and pray for impartation on our, our city leaders, every department leader, every citizen of the friendly city of Bradenton. So we just bless this meeting. We bless the efforts. We bless the work. We bless the workers. And we bless everyone that is here and those that are coming. I pray for this beautiful city that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in Bradenton as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Don, and thank you for all you do as our chaplain for our Braden and Police Department. That. We'll call the meeting to order. Madam Clerk. Yes, this morning we have three proclamations that I'll read on behalf of the mayor. The first one is National Arbor Day, April 26, 2024. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. This holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce ox oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beauty beautify our community. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 26, 2024, as National Arbor Day, and urge all citizens to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and to support our city's urban forestry program by planting trees. <coughs> By planting trees, we help to promote the well-being of present and future generations and enhance our community. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. And do we have anyone here today to accept the award? Um, hi, Council. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any representatives from Tree Board here today. We, they, we did reach out to them. Um, but on their behalf, um, thank you for this. I do want to point out a few things. Uh, we were declared a Tree City USA for the 28th year, so that's exciting. Um, and then also there are two events coming up in honor of Earth Day. We have April 20th, and these are uh, run by the Tree Board. April 20th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Trinity United Methodist, there will be a tree giveaway. And then on April 26th from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at Palma Solo Botanical Gardens. Thank you. Thank you. And I know one of the, if you look around in, in different neighborhoods, HOAs get a lot of the trees. And several years ago, I helped really do about 200 plants and trees. And you can really see the fruits of those labor back then. So it does really make a difference. And our tree board is, is gearing back up to where it used to be before a few years ago when things happened. So we appreciate all they do. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The next proclamation is National Public Safety Telecommunications Week, April 14th through the 20th, 2024. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services. 
And whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers and firefighters is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas safety, the safety of our police officers and firefighters is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the City of Bradenton Emergency Communication Center. And whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services. And whereas they are a vital link for our police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information and ensuring their safety. And whereas public safety telecommunicators of the Bradenton Police Department have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, excuse me, suppression of fires and treatment of patients. Each dispatcher continually exhibits compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their job. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 14th through the 20th, 2024, as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week in Bradenton, in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Thank you. And who do we have coming forward today? We know. <laughs> Bunch of folks. Just a few. <laughs> well, as they come on down here, um, thank you very much. Uh, and on behalf of the dispatchers, and, and she summed it up, um, these are the lifeline for our folks out there on the street. Um, now, police officers, uh, but, you know, during this year as well. The firefighters we can't do our job out there if they're not picking up the phones and answering the the emergency calls that are coming in and sending our folks monitoring our folks and and making sure everybody out there is is safe and sound i have the manager of our dispatch center here brad to say a few words welcome brad uh thank you very much for your continued support it does mean a lot it can be a very thankless job throughout the day dealing with uh just the routine stuff that comes through and then the emergency things that are unexpected. But thank you very much for your support. Any comments? Thank you. I would also uh, encourage you all, we're gonna be making it a point uh, next week to get out to, it's a little difficult, more difficult now to, to visit our, our folks at the dispatch centers, but we're all gonna be making a point to get out there to their building, um, the public safety um, facility and so if any of y'all um, have ever not gone out there and you want the opportunity to go and, and see what's happening out there and see the job they're doing please let me know and I'll make sure that you you can get out there and uh, get a first-hand view of the dedication of these folks Chief Councilman Kramer uh, it's always nice to see Brad out in the light of day <laughs> um, thank you Brad and to your entire staff for everything you've done this year every year uh, like everyone says, you are the heartbeat of what happens. It's like the U.S. mail. It doesn't stop the information coming to you all that you have to pass out quickly, professionally, accurately. It never ends. And uh, you all do it at a great level, and we certainly appreciate that. And I know I just want to thank you because obviously the last couple of years we've had some adjustments moving from this building to the public safety building. And you know, a lot of times change is hard, but when you look towards the future, you know, that change we felt needed to be made for the, the betterment of the long-term success of our city and our community. So um, thank you for, for going through that, and I know it's been a challenge at times, but we appreciate, you know, the opportunity to, to continue to make it better. So thank you for that. All right. You want to you a picture, picture? you got ready want to kind of come up here and we'll kind of stand up here so we can so many people <laughs> I am not standing behind Chief here <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Brian here neither one <laughs> yeah Brian you have to go on your knees <laughs> Every time Brian moves on me. Or a stool. Well, and then Chief Greer. Yeah, put Meredith on the chair. I'm going to bring a ladder. Stand tall. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Madam Clerk. The final proclamation this morning is Suncoast Remake Learning Days, April 20th through May 4th, 2024. Whereas the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading is a four county effort in Charlotte, DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties to help children from birth through third grade, especially those from asset limited families, succeed in life by ensuring they read on grade level. And whereas the Patterson Foundation works with people, businesses, nonprofits, government, and the media to catalyze efforts toward shared aspirations. And whereas Suncoast Remake Learning Days is a 15 day festival that celebrates the many learning opportunities in a community. This celebration highlights innovative experiences, opportunities for youth and participants of all ages to develop their sense of creativity, perseverance, and curiosity. And whereas a variety of organizations such as schools, museums, libraries, after school organizations and more open their doors to welcome families to host hands-on, relevant and engaging educational experiences for youth of all ages and their families, caregivers and educators. These events are free for all ages. And whereas engaging children, parents and families in a wide variety of learning activities outside of classroom hours and school buildings is a powerful way the community can create a learning ecosystem. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Jean Brown, as mayor of the city of Bradenton, Florida, do hereby proclaim April 20th through May 4th, 2024, as Sun Coast Remake Learning Days in Bradenton, and encourage all citizens to participate in the many festival activities. Signed, Jean Brown, Mayor. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Beth Judah. I'm the director of the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading with the Patterson Foundation. We are so thrilled at the growth of Suncoast Remake Learning Days. We started in 2022 with 150 events over four counties in 10 days. Last year, we had 204 events over 10 days in four counties. This year, we have 304 events happening, all of them free open to the public throughout our four county region. It's really an opportunity for us to celebrate that learning happens everywhere and we are thrilled with the more than 277 businesses and organizations that are partnering with us to make this a reality for our community. Thank you and I think it's important there's a lot of volunteers that go into it during the time when what happens during those that week and reading and over those weeks and I just it's, uh, it's a, if you haven't been involved, get involved from the standpoint of volunteering and mentoring because it is rewarding. It's very rewarding so. and important for parents, caregivers, and the children right. to learn together and become lifelong learners. Yes, ma'am. So yes. Great job. And, and what we'd like to do is we'll come around this time to get a picture. Oh, my goodness. So thank you. By yourself. So <laughs> thank you. Madam Clerk. There are not any presentations scheduled this morning. All right, and at this time on our agenda, we're at citizen comments. So citizen comments will be accepted during the citizen comment portion of the meeting 
on any non-agenda items, agenda items, future agenda items, or topic of relevance to the city. Comments will be accepted on the public hearings at the appropriate time. And I'm just going to make one further statement before we, we go to the one card that we have, that um, we had some information on our Facebook with some things going out, and there was some um, comments in there that Tiffany answered very appropriately going through it that said that uh, if you're not a city resident, you can't speak, and that's not a rule or anything that was out there. I think she was misunderstood but actually made a statement that, oh, well, if I live in the county, I can't talk. Anybody can talk during citizen comment. You just have the rules of the three minutes. And, you know, when we're in citizen comment, it's about what we talked about. Otherwise, if it's during a public hearing, it's talking then. So we have never, you know, stopped anybody from talking that wants to come in to talk. You just have to fill out a card, bring it up here, and it doesn't matter if you're city, county, state, out-of-state resident you can still talk. So I just want to make that clear. So thank you. Um, so I only have one card and it's Carolyn Fairbank. You come forward, you have three minutes and please state your name and your city of residence. Good morning, my name is Carolyn Fairbank and I live at uh, Riverwalk, 606 Third Avenue, River Song, I'm sorry, 606 Third Avenue West. I'm going to get right to the point. First, I want to thank you for this comment section. I'm not writing this discussion in prose, but I have bulleted my remarks, and um, I have a copy for everyone, along with a list of 24 people who have stood behind me on this, on this initiative. I want to bring up for your attention a number of ever-growing concerns regarding Riverwalk and the many issues that residents have and are experiencing using that venue. Just to be quite clear, this is not just Carolyn Fairbank bringing up this matter to your attention, but I'm attaching, as I said, my notes and a list of 24 people who have signed, concerned citizens who represent River Dance, River Song, Palmetto, and Parish. Some of these folks are here today. One gentleman in, our, in Riverwalk was accosted by four males on scooters, one of whom smacked him on the back of his head, dislodging his glasses and nearly knocking him over. There's an apparent surge of teenagers, not only during the day, <clears throat> excuse me, but roaming Riverwalk at night and causing loud destruction sometimes between 2 and 3 a.m. The police were called a, long time, a while ago. A number of us, including myself, <clears throat> have nearly been run over by speeding bikes, electric bikes, scooters, and electric scooters and skateboards, which give absolutely no warning as they come up behind you. No audible sound or bells are used. We've even seen two motorcycles tied to a tree near the ferry landing. Will those be next? Who is most affected? Older people with canes and walkers, wheelchairs, parents with small kids who run everywhere, especially down by the splash pad, dog walkers, and even a blind woman who has her service dog with her. You have to have your head on a swivel, and still you can be startled in an instant when they come up beside you. There will be many more heads in beds, as our mayor likes to say. Indeed, there will be plenty of those, and Riverwalk will undoubtedly become an even busier venue. Um, and it's not a matter of if someone is seriously injured, it's a matter of when. Uh, I don't <clears throat> usually like bringing up an issue without some kind of a su suggestion for a resolution, but this is a difficult situation. I believe that Tampa's Riverwalk is pedestrian and regular bikes only. I also saw a piece on ABC News that both Fort Myers and Sanibel have adopted this as well. I, that's what I saw. I, have a discussion, I had a discussion with our mayor about what is considered quality of life. And the mayor suggested to me that it's a subjective, and I do agree with that to a point. But I do believe that on everyone's list would be safety and security. There are no signs on Riverwalk advising the public to use it at their own risk. I stopped by the front desk, this front desk, last Friday morning and asked if I could ask a question of our city attorney. A woman came down to speak to me and asked what I wanted. I said, tried to explain that I was in. Thank you. We, time is up. So. Okay, I'm representing 24 people. Can it, I not finish two paragraphs? No, you're, the time is up. We stick to the three minutes or individuals. There's no okay, group there. You. But if you want to give that and we'll read it um, to, to it. I have no other public comment at this time. Um, 
card, so I will kind of talk and, and have you, you know, obviously, if you want to get with Chief Bevan and talk, and there's some things that are going on, and we're looking at different options with, with the type of, with type of vehicles. Obviously, we don't have scooters anymore that we engaged, but private scooters or some laws. I know, Mr. Rudisell, you brought it up before about on sidewalks and different things that we can regulate. But we will. I think we need to look into that again because I do see some of those e-bikes that are going very fast. So I don't know if we can put like a speed limit. And another thing, I think our IT um, department told me the other day that all of the cameras but one are working. So we do have eyes in the sky up there. And I think that's something our chief can probably get into on Riverwalk. So, so Mrs. Fairbank, if you want to talk with the chief and, and get some of that information, that may help as well. So thank you. Um, seeing no other comments, we'll move forward. Madam Clerk. Item six is the consent agenda. Staff is requesting approval of items A through N. Mr. Chair will entertain a motion. Ms. Barnaby. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, move for approval of the consent agenda with the removal of item I for discussion. Okay, there's a motion by Ms. Barnaby. I'll second. To approve, moving item I and a second by Ms. Coker. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. Three. Yes. Four. Yes. Five. Yes. And one. Yes. Carries four, five to zero. All right, Ms. Barnaby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item I deals with the FDOT agreement for Southern Parkway West Streetscape. And I know that there was a public meeting held on this prior to when I came back on the council. So that's been at least five, six years ago. And I think it's important that we have another public meeting just to remind everyone in the neighborhood what we are talking about with the streetscape and how it's going to affect them. There's also a school on uh, Southern Parkway. I think we need to engage the administration at that school to make sure that they know what's happening and what's kind of coming their way. Um, I am just bringing this up for informational purposes and a request that we do get another public information meeting set up in the last, I don't know, was it six years ago, seven years? Um, people have moved into the neighborhood. They may not be aware of it. People have passed away. Um, I just, I think that's a long time. And I know that we have these long, um, I, I know that FDOT requires that you have a public meeting. I think it's been a long time since we had it. And I just want to make sure that everybody sees what we're talking about and is understanding the process. So um, I guess, Mr. Perry, if, if you could get with Public Works and if we could set that meeting up, I would truly appreciate it. And at this point in time, I will move for approval of Resolution 2433, the FDOT agreement with Southern Parkway West Streetscape. So we'll get a second, and then we'll have further discussion. Correct. Second. Okay, second by Mr. Kramer. And discussion, Ms. Coker? Yeah. Um, I. I'm concerned. Um, I, I did not see anything in here that really gave me a drawing of what exactly they're doing. And I drive that a lot. And I know there's a lot of on-street parking there, and I think that could be affected here. I know I've gotten feedback from the people in Village Green that they've just added the bike lanes to and everything. and. Um, I just think that we need to make sure that everybody knows exactly what DOT is recommending. So thank you, Ms. Barnaby. And I know that does encompass Ward 2 and 3, parts yes. of both, so it's important. And when I was working as <coughs> a council person, we went through it, and one of the things was, and we look at what DOT does, they do great things for our state, local, municipalities and that. But unfortunately, things take so long to get to certain areas that some things change or information and people change. So I think it's important that we do, do reach out. Um, and as we've talked about, it's going to be very important, though, if we do want to make our city more biker 
walker friendly that we do start in pockets of areas and unfortunately it does sometimes do a little angst as we saw on 33rd street court with the it looks like it's a bike path to nowhere but ultimately if you never start you can never continue and finish so that's something that just education i think helps people understand um, but all right yes sir mr perry just briefly um i, I agree with Councilor barnaby and and probably the majority of the council as it relates to the community outreach that's necessary um, but I think it's important to understand a little bit about how um, DOT works and, and this has been a five-year um, ask if you look at uh, uh, the back portion of the package I believe it's page 84 it, in, it involves federal TA LU which is, is federal highway money that comes under safety and multimodal transportation and the like out of the million dollars nine hundred fourteen thousand dollars basically is attributable to that that flows through the, the from the feds to the state for distribution it's a five-year plan to try to access those funds and the like they require a public meeting five years ago I don't know where I was or what was going on and I'm sure people that were at that meeting probably don't have a great memory of, mm -hmm. of what was discussed as well so I think it is important to reach back to the community to advise them where we're at on the project currently is at about a 60 percent design so there is some subject to, to, to finalization of that the project itself will ultimately have to come back before council for approval of the contracts that are related to um, both design uh, f full engineering and and ultimately construction so there'll be ample opportunity to do that what we don't want to have is these types of situations like we had 33rd court where um, there was some discussions early on and then when it became time to build the construction and construct the project um, the the neighborhood reached out with a great deal of concerns at that point in time because it's pretty late in the game so you have my word and, and I was hoping Ms. Clayback would be here I'd at, uh, I think she's got something else come up because she had told me she was planning on, on being here that we will uh, have a, a well thought out community outreach program have meetings in the community get with the school um, uh, there and as you know Southern Parkway has a multitude of both transportation and pedestrian safety issues as well as stormwater this is a multifaceted project that deals with sidewalks it deals with storm stormwater it deals with transportation it deals with multimodal transportation it deals with medians it, it, it's a kind of a big project but this is approving the, the agreement with DOT, not to say that it can't further be improved from the 60% design to the ultimate approval of the contract for construction. So we will work um, in earnest with the community, with that neighborhood, with the associated uh, groups along there, whether it's education and the school district or, or community associations, HOAs and the like, to try to make sure we do the outreach on it. And also on Southern Parkway, we have the ask into the state right now to put the roundabout by the school, right. which will make a huge difference in some of their transportation and speed and, and all of that safety, right. yeah. huge safety. It's so bad pedest right. pedestrian and, 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 and right. school safety issues down by Prime. Right. So yeah. that's already something we've done in asking the state that's in the, just waiting for the uh, signature on it, not the other. We won't mention that word. But, all right, thank you. So we have a motion and a second to approve item I. Let's start the vote in Ward 3. Yes. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. Carries 5 to 0. Madam Clerk. At this time, I'll administer the oath. Anyone wishing to speak during the following public hearings will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the factual statements and representations which you are about to present to this board will be truthful and accurate. Thank you. Thank you. Item 7A is the continuation of public hearing for resolution 2420. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Bradenton, Florida, granting special use permit number SU.24.0223 to permit an indoor amusement center and lounge at 412 12th Street West, Bradenton, Florida. The parcel ID is 33193000004 in the T5 transect zoning district and more particularly described herein, making findings of fact and conclusions of law, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. And this is quasi-judicial, so just to make sure that anybody on the council, if you've had any contact or any concerns or that you'd want to state now would be the time. 
believe anybody has. All right, thank you. Not sure what the blue dot is, or the blue line is on here, but <laughs> it's not my signature. I think Tamara can clear it. <laughs> I'm Greg Deloney, the Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, we had this case heard back on March 13th. There were some concerns and questions that came up from council at that meeting. Um, I did meet with the business owners. Um, we, they did submit a letter to you. Um, if you want me to go through the full presentation, I can. I, can. Um, I have it ready. But what staff is recommending at this point is these seven stipulations that are in front of you. Um, it is basically to place a time limit on um, an age limit of 21 and over after 8 p.m. daily with signage in the front door depicting the regulation. That alcohol sales be limited to beer and wine only with no liquor sales. That games shall be limited to pinball and video games with no simulated gaming machines. That there be no interior access to adjoining properties. That there is that the front window will not be covered um, with means that would block views into the establishment that any signage and advertising shall cover no more than one third of the total window area and that the applicants work with the CRA on some SEPTED funding and also with the police department on principles for safety strategies so these are some recommendations we I met with the like I said with the applicants and the business owners to discuss they are in agreement with this they are here today if you want a confirmation from them but this is our proposal for the recommendation of approval. As you do recall, Planning Commission did recommend 6-0 at their meeting um, without stipulations, and staff also back um, at Planning Commission did recommend six or recommend approval without stipulations also. So these would be new stipulations added to the case. And I think there was also a letter distributed to everybody that was with information. So um, whether it answered all questions or not, that kind of was a little bit subjective on my part when I read through it. You know, it, it answered some, but but as the concerns, um, Vice Mayor Barnaby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I still have a concern or question, and I know that it's that they're working towards this. But when we talk about our hours of operation uh, being afternoon until late, till late. Mm -hmm. That's not a specific time, and I would feel more comfortable having a specific time. I understand. And that's something we can, you can have that discussion with the applicant. Their liquor license will also control their hours of operation. So that would be a stipulate that would be controlled by that also. But if you want to have that con additional stipulation, you can have that discussion with the applicant. I, I would like to have okay, that no discussion. Problem. <laughs> Any other questions Thank before for we me. bring the applicant up for Mr. DeLong? Yes, ma'am. Was there any magic to the 21? I because it's minors, so technically, would should we be stipulating that it's under the age of 18 or splitting hairs? That's a discussion you can have with them. We heard, you know, you don't want minors in there. I know it's 18, but 21 and under, they got to get out anyways with a liquor license, or they can't be served alcohol. Okay, so so we established like the 21. Light. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We'll bring the applicant up. All right. All right. Good morning, just please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Edgar Pantoja, 1237 Riverscape Street, Bradenton, Florida. Thank you. All right, Ms. Barnaby. Good morning. Um, I would just like to narrow that scope down a little bit because late is kind of like art. It's in the eye of the beholder. Well, what we mean by late is, uh, I believe alcohol sales stop at 2, 2.30, whatever it is for the city of Bradenton. Um, we were, you know, there was discussion, maybe we might stay open an extra hour to just capture some extra hungry folks on the block. So until 3 a.m.? Yes, but it's, it's, you know, it's not a mandatory, but yes, like three would probably be the, the latest on any night. Well, you, but you're looking at someone whose grandmother raised her to believe nothing good happens after midnight. So, agreed. Um, but keep in mind, we're only selling uh, beer and wine as far as the alcohol goes. Um, we mostly um, we're banking on that most of our sales will be from food, um, and that's really what we at that time of night. That's the focus is food, not alcohol. There's plenty of block, there's plenty of, plenty of bars on that block that serve everything. Um, that's, you know, that's for them. We just want to uh, serve food at that time after the bar's closed. 
Because anybody that's partied downtown I'm knows not that. Uh, <laughs> I am not comfortable with you being open after the bars close. Okay. We already have enough issues in our downtown area with individuals that choose to be irresponsible. What time does the bars um, have to close at? Two o'clock. Two. Two a.m. Okay. That's fine. We'll do two if that's what that's what it takes. What? Mr. Kramer. Um, point of order, though, it is actually. Generally, they do last call it to the alcohol sales stop at 2.30. Okay. Um, the concern I have, and I think it's echoing what Ms. Barnaby is concerned about, um, for years, the only after-hours food option was a basically hamburger hot dog stand that was outside of what is now Bamboozer. That attracted everyone who was hungry, who was coming out of bars intoxicated, right. who wasn't intoxicated. But every, everyone coming to one as a magnet to one spot, whether you're, at that point you wouldn't be able to sell alcohol anyway because it would be after hours, draws a different dynamic that I don't know that was successful, which is why that person is no longer down there selling food. It became dangerous. There were, the police department could tell you exactly details if we had them, but I promise you there were more than enough incidents, including me getting assaulted. Um, in those late hours, um, so I would not be in favor of after hours either, after alcohol sales either. Okay. That's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, is that 2 or 2.30, just to be clear? That would be after, after the last call, which is traditionally 2 o'clock. Okay. And I know that I, I don't want to, at the same time, I don't want to cut into your business model or anything like that. I'm just saying that if day one everybody realizes that and that crowd on certain nights decides, hey, we've got a place we can eat right here as opposed to going off somewhere else, <coughs> that's, it's going to be a magnet, and it could be a magnet for trouble, as we've seen in the past. Understood. Mr. Perry. Mayor, a little bit on behalf of economic development and community safety and, and, and the downtown of Florida. Pull your microphone. Thank um, you. I appreciate Mr. Pantoja's letter and, and trying to work with the city, and, and I think most of the city council wants to promote economic development, give people a fair shake to try whatever business model they have within reason. But I don't know how familiar you are with the problems we have in the downtown corridor, particularly on Main Street, with where, where what's left open is about three to four bars after 10 o'clock at night. And we have an influx of people that come from different parts of Manatee County and perhaps elsewhere. Um, whether it be Whitfield to the south, Ananko, um, uh, uh, Palmetto, whatever it is, because they have rules over there and there aren't things to do. So the late night drinking crowd, from what I understand, kind of congregates and goes downtown. <coughs> Talking with the police a lot, there's a lot of activity, which is, is police related, in the surrounding areas where people go out to their cars, there's a parking lot, they park on the street, and they might consume alcohol and maybe even deal a little bit of dope out there. Um, things get rowdy, and we don't want that downtown. And, 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 you know, I'm not saying that nothing good happens after Jeopardy, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure, but I'm pretty sure nothing good happens after midnight. And, and, and so I, I can't imagine, you know, if, if it's to capture the hungry drinker, that that's not going to attract a certain element and already exacerbate an already existing problem. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Well, a couple of the things, obviously, we've tried to do uh, for economic development is bring different type of businesses downtown. But the model that, you know, we have stated up here is that we want more restaurant-type bars that will not attract the crowd. We've got restaurants that would probably, with the restaurant closing, stay open a little later maybe with the their bar part of the restaurant. But that's not the... The crowd they're drawing and so they're closing early and we've got people coming down to look at opening others that don't want that you know don't want to be here because of that and we're trying to turn it more to a restaurant type situation where it's not then attracting some and we're also looking at closing that parking lot it's a city parking lot and it's become a, a magnet for the police department so that parking lot's going to be closed at night at a certain time so you know we want people we just don't want the element that is an Ebor City type I get it. situation. And, and, and so. We don't want any trouble either. Right. Yeah. That, that causes a strain on us. Right. Yeah. Um, 
So if, if 2 a.m. works for you guys, that works for us, we'll shut Vice, down with the rest of the block. Vice Mayor Barnaby. Yes, I just have a, a question for either Mr. DeLong or Mr. Rudisil, because this is a special exception, special use permit. The hours that we state that he can, or whatever is there can be open, does that like run from now on? If, if, we, if we put stipulations in here that have specific hours of operations. Yes, that would run with the land with the approval. The special use. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's the other concern I have is it's once the, the council chooses to take action, however they choose to do it, it's pretty much forever and ever amen. And, and there is some where if they close and for so long they lose part of that, I believe, if they're a time right. Or if, if they are not in compliance with the, with right. the stipulations, then obviously it could be, could be removed. Can we put a stipulation on it that it runs with this owner, this business, or it just goes with the property forever? Um, it's difficult to, to put stipulated on a on a particular owner just based on the criteria that you're applying um, so no I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend doing that miss Coker yeah I, I'm uh, I guess I'm a little what do you uh, are there I guess I'm not following what c concerns you would have with it just staying with the property um, it's not based on the owner it's just are you talking about the hours of operation I'm or talking about if we put stipulations on here that they can stay open until 2 a.m and then for whatever reason, perhaps, perhaps they make a great deal of money and they decide to move on and somebody else comes in and then we have another bar until 2 a.m. Well, am I wrong? If it's a special use permit, if somebody changes the use, it's gonna have to change anyway. Well, they would still be subject to all of these stipulations, right? So you've got the limitation on the beer and wine only. If they wanted to serve liquor, they, they'd have to come back in and, and amend their, their special permit um, so yes all all the stipulations that are proposed would apply to a future owner as well but what if they stop selling pinball or having pinball and video games and it just becomes a hangout does that if they don't have the pinball and video games does that change the special use um, the special use is for the um, for the amusement uh, facility so if, if they weren't using that at, uh, at that point they might be considered either a restaurant or a lounge depending on uh, depending on the type of use so that would be something that could be reviewed in the future mm -hmm. if that were to happen but if they leave go ahead miss moore um i was just going to clarify i think that they are so are applying for lounge so i think even okay, so without the, yes i think it's both but um mr russo or miss singer or mr delong i'm sorry um my understanding is that when we're looking at special use permit requests, if they meet the criteria, there's not a lot of wiggle room to deny it. So I appreciate the conversation regarding the stipulations. Um, I just wanted to point out that to the extent that we're already cooperating and having stipulations that, that address some of our concerns, I don't want to overstep and then, and then lose that spirit of cooperation. Chief, look like the chief has. I, one I agree with that, Mrs. Moore. But also, we could add more stipulations that would help some of the council people feel better because the number of phone calls I get about the bars on Main Street is is what's concerning to me. That it's growing, and that we need to really figure out. I know I heard years ago, and I wasn't here, but I wasn't on the council or that, but. Sometimes you have to start a city with the bars to get kind of some of that energy going. But, you know, we've stayed it all along and, and, you know, we're getting a restaurant now on Main Street called Jack's that's moving into the next to the old Badass and Badass is supposedly coming in. And one of the important things to me when I talked to that gentleman two years ago was that we don't want just a bar downtown. We want food. And um, I drove over to his restaurant last night in Palmetto because we were looking for something like that and it would have been so nice to be able to walk down to something like that you know downtown so I mean it's a little bit off subject but but it's again we want more of that and that's what we're hearing from the residents so 
I think that, you know, some of this is just kind of, you know, and, and maybe some of the angst is from some of the things that have happened in the past, not against you. I feel like that's what it is. But, but it was in that building, and it was illegally done with the cover on the window, so we just want to make sure something doesn't turn into that. And it's because I'm for this. I mean, I think that this is a great idea because it's not the old pinball machines that you'd go to the mall and you'd drop your kids off and then you'd walk the mall and you felt safe they were in there playing. It's more of a entertainment type thing. And, and I think it's, it's something that could, you know, enhance our downtown along with other things coming, but not just somebody that's at a bar drunk at 1.30 a.m. walking into your place playing and then the issue becomes yours. So I think that's something. So I do think our chief wants to have a comment. So uh, maybe let her comment and, and see, and then we can, before we go to public hearing. Really, really just a question. Um, I'm, I'm seeing the stipulation, but uh, I, I would like to know what the enforcement mechanism, mechanism is for, number one, if they violate a, one of the terms of the stipulation, uh, who's going to act on that? It's going to probably be the police. So I, I guess I want to have some clarity, and maybe that's a later discussion. But then, regarding the arm, or regarding the um, uh, having the 21 and over only after 8 o'clock, uh, can we require in conjunction with that armbands? Because I, I don't want us to have to keep going in checking for minors. I want to know that everybody in there has been armband. We have somebody at the front door. If you don't have somebody at the front door, there, there's not going to be compliance. So are we going to have to require them to be at the front door checking the identifications? I think you have to have that if you're going to require one. And then I just don't understand if we do go by and they are violating every one of these, what's, what, what is the police department's recourse would be my question. I just want some Mayor, I have a couple questions, Chief. Chief, it seems to me that the crowd changes around 10 o'clock, maybe a little bit even earlier down there. Um, 2 o'clock is pretty late in the morning. <laughs> um, 21, you can be down there. They got the Kava thing that's 24 7, I think, or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I don't know what types of people go out at 2 in the morning. I, I really don't. Maybe I'm just aged out or something. But um, I used to. Yeah, yeah, I used to too. About 30 Friday. years after we yeah. 30 years ago. <laughs> no. But um, I, I guess from the enforcement perspective, it would seem to me that we would end up having to do something with code enforcement and, and police and, and maybe the fire department, you know, whoever else. And we have to take those resources to basically pull something back. You know, we, you, you have a problem, it develops, and you go, okay, we got to deal with this problem. And you assemble the right disciplines to do that. It takes, it takes tax money to do that and the like. And, and I don't know about your staffing downtown, but I know that we're pretty thin. And um, it, do you think that would put an additional onus on you? I mean, I think that's why you're up here and you're concerned. Well, I'm concerned about and, and, the, and your staff. Number one, I, I don't want us to have to be standing there and continually going in, you know, checking for, when I say mine, or somebody who can't drink. That's going to be the issue is are they out there drinking um, and are they out there driving? Um, so I, I think that's a great stipulation. I just want, I want some teeth to it, and we want to be able to walk by at 2 a.m. and see that somebody's there checking IDs and that people in there have armbands. And if we walk in there and there's somebody without an armband, um, what are the sanctions to that? Uh, you know, I get what you're saying about at 2 a.m. If I, it, or 155. Yeah, or 155 or, or 1255 or maybe 1155, um, I'm not so sure that's good to have downtown. I agree with the mayor, because I've seen these kinds of arcades. We went to one, I think it was in Pittsburgh, that was a great little place to go that had different types of amusement activities and had food service in there. And the people you saw in there were uh, lunch crowd businesses where 10 or 15 people would go there and play skeet ball or whatever it was. And I think that that can do it. Now, I know you guys are pinball more than anything. And I think six pinball machines. How much of an amusement center is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep in mind, we're not the ones that ask for, uh, for the special use. Okay. Well, I, 
Well, I think you have to have yeah, it. Yeah, you have to have it. The business. Yeah. This is our well, rules. Well, you know, let's say there's bars on the block that have three, four pinball machines. They have a, uh, they have darts. They have pool tables. Why isn't that a business? You know, why isn't that an amusement center? Where our unit is very small. We're just gonna, few, you know, a few pinball machines in there, a couple of arcade uh, video machines, and it's not like we're opening up a Chuck E. Cheese. It's would you a, be Would you be opposed to having a restriction of I don't know ten o'clock or eleven o'clock, opposed to two a.m. Because this is the world of difference to me. In, the, in between those time it's frames, up, yeah. I'm sorry. It's almost going to cripple the, uh, the business. Is that what you feel? Okay, just asking your opinion. No, and I appreciate that question, Mr. Perry. But uh, you know, again, he's trying to come up with a business model that can work, be good stewards of the neighborhood, <coughs> the street, and make some money. You know, I mean, that's it's about you know business development and, and trying that. But that is true. Um, unfortunately, we've seen the the consequences of the bar only after 10 o'clock because what Mr. Perry and I saw and, and I went back after like seven, eight o'clock to see how it was operating and it was still the, the young professional coming down there playing those games and that and that's, so when I heard about this, I was excited that that's what it was. But it seems like to me, it's just turning into a bar with just some pinball machines, even though you're not serving alcohol, uh, liquor. Uh, but you're serving beer and wine. So, you know, I mean, again, I think it's something that, you know, is an opportunity for some entertainment for others, but most others that have, again, the general public does not want to go down there after 10 o'clock, and they keep telling me that. And they said, until we change that, we're just going to be a bar, and we're going to have more police activity after that because that's what's happening. That's the reality, you know, and, and again, we don't want to be that city that gets those national news because that one thing happened. So unfortunately, I think this council and administration is going to ask the tough questions because, you know, once we, as, as Ms. Barnaby said, once we approve it, it's there. And some approvals were probably done. I look back on my council days and in particular one or two. I would not have approved knowing what I know now. And again, it's not to slow our city, it's to make our city better for everyone. So I, I just, that's what it is, so. Other comments, questions, Ms. I, Coachman? I just wanna say, um, I hope you don't feel like we're beating up on you. No, not at all. But I think you also hear what we're saying is, I know you're saying, well, you already have this, so what's the problem? Well, that is the problem. <laughs> There's some things that we already have that we don't want to continue. So, not that we're beating up I on you. Feel, uh, um, I don't feel like we would add to the current problem. You know, we're only serving beer and wine. We're not going to be the cheapest on the block. We can't compete with these big bars. So, I think all of your problems are still going to be at the bars, not you know, at the little spot with some pinball machines and serving <laughs> beer and wine and, yeah, I think and food. We, pro we probably thought that too back in the day when we started this, you know, we probably thought also <coughs> it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Um, but, but it does sound like you will end up being the magnet, you know, once everyone else is full. And, and if it becomes an issue, then obviously we don't want to be working, you know, we don't want it to be a hassle for us also. So if that did happen, we would end up closing early, but we just don't want to be locked in. And I don't blame you for that, but the only problem is once we give the special use, our hands are tied then. You know, it's not there. Ms. Moore, I think I had a question. I was gonna ask a question if you don't mind reminding me, Mr. DeLong, about food and whether, there, is food tied to the special use and required at certain hours or at all? I think that the food component is probably important. Right. To the, the, the lounge the portion comes into play because of the alcohol sales. If it was a restaurant only, that is permitted in downtown. So the, the lounge is related to the alcohol, and indoor amusement centers are listed as a special use in our um, form base code. So, Ms. Moore, you don't mind jumping in, then why do these other 
bars are allowed to have pinball machines and pool tables and that. Is that something that is they are not allowed to have right now with what they're doing? They're primarily a bar. They should have came through. I would have to go back and research as a lounge. So if they did a lounge, they could have a pool table or a pinball machine? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't normally go to any type of bar that doesn't have a pool table or something. Yeah, here comes Ron. Right. So. <laughs> And as we know, we are researching our other cafe licenses and different things to make sure that some businesses did not just pop up, open up, and then do things that were incorrect. So Old Main Street is being evaluated now through our planning department because we want to make sure everybody is meeting the correct stipulations that they should have. And if they aren't, they're going to have an opportunity to get it. And if they don't want to get it, then they're not going to have the opportunity to leave things on the sidewalk. And then there's rules that they're not abiding by, even if they do have it. So those things are being addressed. Uh, I just wanted Singer. to say, um, Robin Singer, Planning Community Development Director. Uh, this came to our attention through a building permit process. And when you look at the floor plan, the majority of the space is occupied by pinball machines. Uh, as opposed to a bar that may have a pinball machine tucked in the corner. That's the majority of the space. The other thing that appears on the plan is essentially a bar configuration. Um, there doesn't appear to be a kitchen, tables and chairs, that sort of thing that you would normally associate with a restaurant. So when we had conversations with them, and, and I think there's partnership in, involved in this business, and, and you, uh, it's different talking to different people. So I believe the gentleman who presented to you last time uh, really is representing the pinball interest, the, the gaming interest uh, in this proposition. And then there are others who are looking at it from a, a business perspective that may involve, you know, and, and really more insisting at, that there be beer and wine sales. Now, the cutoff for a lounge is if your food sales, uh, do they outweigh your, your receipts from uh, beer and wine? And so we were being cautious with them just because, again, what we're seeing on the floor plan appears to be a bar, not a restaurant, um, that they probably are going to exceed, you know, uh, their, their potentially um, alcoholic beverage sales would exceed food sales. We don't know that for a fact, and they, they could, you know, withdraw that part of it if they absolutely believe that 50% or more is going to be uh, exclusively in food sales. Um, but we just thought it's better to be cautious rather than trip on that and have to close that part of it um, because you didn't get the approval for the lounge portion of it. But I say by floor plan, this appeared to us to be an indoor amusement center um, more so than a restaurant. All right, so I have a question maybe for you or Mr. Rudisell. We approve this as is today, and all of a sudden, six months from now, the pinball machines go away. Are they still, uh, now it's just a bar. Is that, well, but, but again, it depends how much food you're serving. And, you know, but, but now we've just created another bar that is something that I don't think that this town wants. And is that, then, then they can just still operate that way? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in the document now that would require them to maintain the amusement component, no. So they'd still be subject to all the stipulations, but you're, you're right, they would still have the approval for the lounge. Mm -hmm. now, can am, I, am I not remembering, didn't this first come to us pitched as a family-friendly mm -hmm. business? Mm -hmm. I'm not really hearing Feeling that, that anymore, right? Uh, I think it was all the concerns. Come up, to the, mic the come up to the microphone if you don't mind, thank you. Uh, we're focusing on nighttime here. Mm -hmm. um, during the day, obviously, it's... Oh, it's not really necessarily geared to family-friendly. Well, during the day, it is. It's, um, it just seems to be the focus right now. It's about the nighttime drunks. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what we've seen. And, and it's turned in, you know, and I, and I know that the, there's been several bars around the county that they have code enforcement and closed. And where are they coming? So, I mean, we're not trying to, to hurt your business or go through that, but it's, it's a part of how we manage to make sure you're successful without having to, to be that. And that's, that's why we're talking about it. Otherwise, I think this council probably would have voted last time to just say no, and we didn't want to do that. 
So, um, may I, may I yes, ma'am. Yes, it's um, more. Is may we have a stipulation that ties the two special use special uses together? Can we stipulate that a stipulation is for the lounge that we remain that we have a special use for an amusement facility and that they well I guess we don't need that so that's the stipulation I would suggest yeah. if that's permissible um, yeah we could we could do that as a stipulation we'd have to work on the language a little bit but I think we could come up with something that would accomplish that if that was something that the council wanted to do and the applicant was in agreement mr. mayor if I know we need to have the public hearing, but would it be possible at this time to take a brief recess and ask Mr. Rudisil to work on that language? That might make, I know that would make me feel a little more comfortable. I'm still having an issue with staying open until the time when everybody comes pouring out into the street. And I would not support you being open after the bars close. Right. So we. we if we said that two o'clock, then we all have to leave at the same time. So, so there's nobody pouring into our location. Mm -hmm. Still, still working on that slow yes to maybe rather than a fast no. So hey, uh, were you you weren't here at the last meeting, were you? No, I could not. So he didn't hear that. So. Yeah. Um, but again, we're talking about it because we're trying to find a way to to make it happen. So I appreciate that. Um, is it appropriate to take a recess before the public hearing, or should we have the public hearing? Council can take a recess whenever we'd like. All right, so let's that, take. But is that something that I know I'm putting you on the spot, mm -hmm. and I apologize for that. I didn't think about this before until we you all think? started having these discussions. So again, I apologize for that. But you went to the University of Florida Law School. I think you ought to be able to come up with something, right? <laughs> What, what are you saying he needs an extra 15 minutes no I was not saying that at all I was just complimenting his education yes. we, we can we can certainly come up with some language for a stipulation like that and in, in five minutes ten minutes yeah okay uh, miss Coker before we recess yeah I, I, I would just like to say I appreciate you doing that because I think it'd be good to come to a conclusion on this today rather than yeah. Table it. That's what I'm trying yeah. to. Yeah, I'd like to see us get this decided today. All right, so we'll take a, a 10 minute recess and come back at 9 42. The responses we heard earlier and the comments heard. Um, I did not type this up, but it's handwritten. Um, we'll get it cleaned up um, later on. But these are the stipulations that they have agreed to. Um, so we added some stipulations on wristbands after 8 p.m. Um, under item one. We did add the square footage of the area, um, primarily encompassing a majority of the property remaining in indoor amusement center. Um, so they can have that. And then under number nine, um, that they close at 2 a.m. and that they are allowed to open at 6 a.m. because they do have a plan to serve breakfast and kombuchas and coffees in the morning. So they would like to be able to reopen at 6 a.m. Um, I did run this by the two business owners and they are in agreement with these nine stipulations. Mr. Barnaby, any questions? Okay, so. I mean, it's not my Again, handwriting. I mean, I, I, I know, and I, 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 I want to express my appreciation to yeah. you all. I know I, I kind of threw this out there, but no hill for a climber. I knew that you all could could get it put together. Um, you know, sometimes sitting up here, it's like being a mom for fifty-seven thousand people. It's the only thing I can really compare it to. Um, and it seems like every time I turn around, it reminds me of what I was dealing with my kids. And they would ask to do something or they would say that, you know, and, and I always had, you know, we always had to have a plan. And the plan keeps changing and the hours keep changing. And it is giving me just a very uncomfortable feeling. So um, I know that, that we continued this, and I know that we're going to need to do a public hearing. Um, but I still have some grave concerns, and I just want to express that. Ms. Coker. 
Yeah, um, I have to say, when this initially came before our last meeting, I had a lot of concerns, and it was really portrayed as a family um, establishment, and now it seems like it's completely changed um, back to what could have been what I was concerned about to begin with. But um, I mean, I'm I want to I want people to be successful down there, and so I'm still listening but I'm I don't know that I'm quite there yet mr. Kramer and respectfully I sort of disagree with you um, I think it's both I think Chuck E. Cheese isn't open until midnight mm -hmm. but if it was there's a good chance that the crowd might change a little bit if there weren't a bunch of kids there my point is that if it's gonna be open till 8 for families that's sort of what we expected and if it's going to be a bar that's going to want to try to make any type of money downtown, it's going to have to be open after that. And that's what it becomes really after eight is a bar for adults. So. Yeah. We do have to go to the public hearing. So why don't we do that? And uh, um, I, I'm just a procedural question, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Rudersill. Again, because I, and I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. DeLong, I know standing up there is so much fun. Um, I still need more information. If I wanted to make a motion to table this, to be able to give staff and the applicant time to try to get information together to make our decision one that we can be a little more comfortable <coughs> with, what would the appropriate time to be to do when when would that be done um, well we need to open the public hearing and see if there are any members of the public here that, that want to provide comment on this and then at that time um, the council could consider a motion to continue again if we have a, a time date in place certain and that would be the motion we would want to confirm with the applicant that they did not have an objection to the continuance and and that's where that a slow yes or maybe or a fast no comes into mind just throwing that out there all right at this time we'll open the public hearing anyone wishing to speak anyone wishing to speak I'm John Paul Taylor uh, half owner of this place um, we have two owners uh, Eddie was the other owner I'm one I'm the pinball guy that spoke last time um, the reason that hours are there is because we want to try to <coughs> pay for rent you know we you know they, they said eight o'clock I said why don't we do six because we do want to do breakfast we we he's different than me so uh, we want our we want to have the ability to make rent so we don't know I mean a year from now, we might be open six in the morning till eight p.m. You know, so that's why it's confusing. We're trying to bring something different. You know, we're trying to do some food, a uh, place to hang out, play pinball, and all that stuff. So that's why the hours are up in the air. We don't know. A year from now, we might be open in the morning till evening. We might be open later because that's where that's where the beer money is. You know. Um, most of our drinks are going to be, we have a cappuccino machine, we have energy drinks, we have tea, we have kombucha. That's where I believe we're going to be very successful. Uh, we've just been told it would be a risk not to have beer on that street, so we don't know. A year from now, we might not have beer there at all. That'd be okay with me. doesn't matter. So we do want to have um, that available to be, you know, whatever our hours are. So. I'm not going to be there at 2 in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to be there in the morning. I'll probably be leaving at 5. I'm getting too old to be hanging out at 2 in the morning. So I understand the concerns. So I just wanted to clear it by, because that seems to be what the situation is, is the hours. So we don't know the hours. I mean, I, we are going to be open um, in the morning, and then we're going to be open late. We're going to try it out. If it doesn't work, we don't want that late night element that we all know about. I don't want it. So that's all I can say is that, I mean, that seems to be what's getting stuck here is the hours. So. I mean, I wish we had solid hours, but I want to make money. I want to be able to pay rent. I want to be able to sell pinball machines and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Just by coincidence, I 
happen to have state agents here with uh, alcohol, beverage, and tobacco. And so if anybody had any questions for them, um, they are in the back of the room, they could, they could answer that. I'm not an expert on that, but um, he's certainly informing me on some of the requirements, having signs posted. Um, you can't have anybody under 21 sitting at the bar. Potentially every pinball machine will have to have a separate license through the state. And so um, I guess my message is we are um, starting to take a very um, concerted effort to crack down on all things um, illegal when it comes to our bars and um, serving alcohol, our machines um, throughout the, the city. And, uh, you know, rest assured that we're going to be monitoring everything and every business um, very closely, so, which is why they're here. I don't Thank know you. if anybody has any questions, um, but I don't want to put them on the spot either, but um, they're here. All right, thank you. Can we ask them if they have any recommendations? All right, Mr. Perry. Well, we're in public comment, so let me get through that. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Don't. In Mr. Rudisill, if yeah, it, it closes the public hearing, we have to re-advertise everything again, correct? Well, we can reopen, but I'd just leave it open. And leave, leave the public hearing open? Okay. So at this point, if we go to, does any council have any further questions of anyone or concerns or options? Mr. Perry, yes, microphone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think John Paul Taylor, <clears throat> one of the co-owners said it best. We don't know. We don't know. And, and the lawyer in me says that once you provide the permissive special use, they have it. And, and the city's chance to regulate it has come and gone. I think we all want something downtown that'll be successful, and we appreciate business people that put their capital at risk and, and take a chance to mm -hmm. do an endeavor and an undertaking. And we want them to be successful, and we'll try to keep them safe, keep the area safe, and make them successful. I think in order to do that, we need a little bit more time to sit down. It's probably going to be a give and take situation. Like Mr. Taylor said, we may close at eight in the future and the like, and, and that uncertainty is there, and, and, and maybe that would help us with one problem. At the same time, he said something about we got to pay rent. And as Councillor Kramer pointed out, that's part of having a bar crowd uh, to a certain extent. And, and I think that there's a certain tolerance that, we're, is, that the council, in my opinion, is, is okay with. They understand that that's a, at a certain point in time, it becomes kind of an adult entertainment area and the like, and, and that we're willing to give some concessions in that and not say absolutely not or anything like that. But we do need more time to probably get with um, the, the owners and, and uh, to try to see if we can come to a compromise where we know more, because right now we don't know. Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Again, like I said, it's sometimes I feel like I'm mom to the community up here but I need to have a good understanding of the hours of your operation and exactly how you're going to be doing this because we've heard so many iterations of well well we could do this or we could do that or we could do the other thing but a special use permit is not just something that when you drive by City Hall, we throw it in your window. This, it's a very serious matter for the city. So at this time, I would like to make a motion that we continue this public hearing until our next council meeting on April the 24th. We and have that's a motion, my motion to continue to the 24th. I'll second it. Are we permitted to have discussion? Just one second, let me get this. Yeah, it's not, a, I didn't table it. Okay. I just made a motion to continue it. Okay, so discussion, Ms. Moore? Um, did, uh, did when, when uh, staff was discussing it with the applicant, I am going to assume that there's, that the exploration of having a kitchen in an older building was possibly discussed or considered and we didn't is there is that prohibitive cost 
if they had a kitchen, would we not be having this discussion because then they would operate under the cafe and we would not be worried about it? Um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I think, yeah, I think having a kitchen, I don't know that they have space to have a kitchen in there and, and turn this into a full, but that's up to them. I mean, they have the opportunity to, you know, guarantee that they're not going to exceed sales and, and do some other things, but, you know, we can talk to them about that further, about what they can do to maybe take away the lounge designation entirely and, and further limit hours. I'd so that it's more indoor amusement and less. Again, I'm, I'm trying to come up with I, either a slow yes or, or you know, I, I'm trying to avoid the fast no. I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to get the information I need to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mayor, may I? Yes, ma'am. Um, what I'm, uh, what I'm struggling with is um, that it seems to me that really it's going to be hard to police any type of establishment. Um, to Mr. Kramer's point, I think many types of establishments, in my opinion, there's no uh, conflict between having a facility that during the daytime is like uh, a brewery that has cornhole for your children, but then after a certain hour, I would not have my children there. Um, so to me, that's not a conflict of use. And so I guess the question is, at what point are we, you know, is this the appropriate vehicle for saying that we don't want a lot of bars there, or should we actually be on a more general matter, you know, in, with planning and, and the process they're going through, saying that, that's the, that we're going to limit that in some other legal way? Um, where I'm at right now is it, it appears to me that the applicant has endeavored to alleviate our concerns. And I, I feel somewhat prepared to go ahead and decide today. I appreciate that not, you know, that you want more information, and and I think that's fine. But I also feel like the applicant has worked with staff fairly diligent is my diligently is my understanding, and I don't know how much more we can ask of them from a business standpoint that will make it work. <coughs> I mean, until we make some decisions about how, what we want downtown to look like in a general matter, most facilities are going to be, you know, bright and light in the daytime, and they're going to be like lounges in the evening. One of the things, though, with the decision wise, this is a special use. So if we do come up with a decision later on that's different than this special use, then we're still stuck with the special use. So we're trying to get to some of those um, mm. policies that will benefit them as being successful. Because again, I don't think it, this would have been a lot easier two weeks ago just to vote and say no if you're saying it's and it's over with. But we're trying to come up with that where we don't want to say no to make it successful. But we've been through that. We have a 20 year plus history of uh, bars now that have come in and said some things and then turned around and did the opposite. And for whatever reason, we can't stop it other than we police it. And the policing is becoming harder and harder and more dangerous after those times. And, you know, I mean, it's the information's out there, but I don't think, you know, most of the residents feel like they have to be off our street by 10 o'clock the ones that you know and we don't want that we don't want that feeling sure. <coughs> Ms. Coker <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, I uh, I want to be at yes but I am struggling a little bit um, but I feel like big picture I think this is what Councilwoman Moore was alluding to is I think we've I we all kind of feel that there might be an issue down there and maybe we need to be looking at a bigger thing to uh, work with the problem. Um, but like you said, it's special use and then, it, then we're stuck with it. Um, so I, I, I'm 
still perplexed a little bit, and that's as much as I wanted to get to an answer today. I feel like uh, I'm not there yet. All right, so we have a motion on the board to continue to April 24th. Um, Mr. Mayor, but yes, sir. I was just going to say we need to bring the applicant up, make sure they're in agreement okay. with that before we take a take a vote on it. Take a vote. All right, sir. If you'd like to come forward, I think your options are to agree to this or not agree to it. And if you don't agree to it, then the motion would be taken. A motion could be made to either approve or deny, and then whatever happens with that, that's the final word. So I guess we agree. You agree to, to wait the, to come back on the 24th and see what others can be, hopefully, to get your slow yes, as Ms. Barnaby would say. Agreed. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. And, Thank you. And also, just to clarify, it's at 8.30 in these chambers. 8.30 a.m. on April 24th in the City Hall chambers here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've had discussion. We have a motion to continue till April 24th, 2024 at 8.30 a.m. in City Hall Chambers here by Ms. Barnaby, seconded by Ms. Coker. Start the vote in Ward 4. Yes. 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. No. Uh, carries 4 to 1. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, thank you. The next item is item 7B, the second reading and public hearing for ordinance 4025, an ordinance of the city of Bradenton, Florida, providing for an amendment to the city of Bradenton land use atlas, changing zoning from T4R general urban restricted to T4O general urban open. For properties located at 910 Riverside Drive East, 111 10th Street East, 111 or I'm sorry 1008 Riverside Drive East 1010 Riverside Drive East and 1020 Riverside Drive East the parcel ID numbers are 321 3210005 3210500359 3210500309 3212400000 and 3210500409 providing for applicability providing for severability and providing for an effective date can we read them both you want to do both we can if that's up to the council but yes yeah, we certainly read them can both, yes. uh, okay it's just reading them we'll talk about them separately okay the second reading and public hearing for ordinance 4026, an ordinance of the city of Bradenton, Florida, providing for an amendment to the city of Bradenton land use atlas, changing zoning from T4O, ur general urban open to T5 urban center for properties located at 214 9th Street East, 208 9th Street East, 112 9th Street East, 110 9th Street East, 108 9th Street East, 406 9th Street East, 304 9th Street East and 402 9th Street East. The parcel ID numbers are 313-478-0008, Excuse me, I lost my place. <laughs> and 313-750-0007 removing properties located at 214 9th street east 208 9th street east 112 9th street east 110 9th street east 108 9th street east 406 9th street east 304 9th Street East, 301 9th Street East, 201 9th Street East, 825 3rd Avenue East, 108 8th Street East, 106 8th Street East, 807 3rd Avenue East, and 402 9th Street East. Parcel ID numbers are 313-470008, 313-480008, 313-480009, 
and 31388-0002 from the Antiques Overlay District, providing for applicability, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I don't believe you missed a zero, so. <laughs> Uh, good morning, City morning. Council. This is Jamie Schindelwolf representing the Planning Department, and I have been sworn. Um, what you have that Greg is passing out, uh, thank you, Greg. Um, those are some citizen comments we received prior to Planning Commission. They didn't make it in your City Council packet, um, so that's why we're passing them out right now. Did you get this one, Pam? I think I got two of them. Is there, oh, just to make sure, I got. Two. I think I got two of the same thing. Oh, no, no, it's they, different. It is different. Yeah, the, the case number is different. Okay. All right. Okay, so it's oh, different. Okay. All right, starts out the same, but different. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Continue. All right. Um, so as stated, I am Jamie Schindelwolf with Planning Department, and I have been sworn, and I am here to present the staff recommendations for these cases today. So the first case before you is LU234560, a request for a zoning atlas amendment from T4R to T4O. This map shows the subject parcels for this request. And here you can see the zoning and the future land use in this area as it stands today. The future land use is urban village which is defined as an area that is anticipated to develop with the character, lifestyle, friendliness of a village based on the concepts of new urbanism. Permitted uses encourage development of a district with a distinct sense of place and a walkable environment that supports and enhances abutting neighborhood areas. Desired uses include small lot single family, multiple family row ho houses, mid-rise housing types, professional and medical offices, restaurants, retail stores, etc. This request, as stated, is to rezone from general urban restricted to general urban open on these properties. These photos were taken of the surrounding area. The neighborhood consists primarily of single family homes with some vacant lots. There are a couple duplexes in the area. Glazer Gates Park is south of this rezoning request and the eastern portion of the Riverwalk is nearby. Shoreview apartments are adjacent to this request, and the Preserve at Riverwalk apartments are within a block. This chart that may be difficult to read, but was also in the staff report, um, shows the differences between the T4O, T4R allowances and the T4O allowances. The T4 general urban zone consists of a mixed use, but primarily a residential urban fabric. It may have a wide range of building types, and the setbacks are variable. There are two subzones, T4R, which is general urban restricted, and T4O, general urban open. T4O is more permissive than T4R. In T4R, it's stated that structures should be one to 2.5 stories with a potential height after all bonuses of 3.5 stories. In T4O, Structures should be one to three stories with a potential height after all bonuses of six stories. When considering a land use atlas amendment, uh, we have to consider these criteria from the code. The first is consistency with the comprehensive plan. Staff finds T4O is consistent with the future land use category of UV, and there are many existing areas with T4O zoning and um, UV future land use already. Staff finds the rezoning request is a continuation of T4O zoning that surrounds this property or these parcels already. 
Um, staff does not find that this uh, will have an impact on adequate public facilities as it is not increasing density or intensity. Those are governed by, excuse me, the, um, the future land use category, which is not changing. The rezoning request represents just a small expansion of an existing district and does not introduce any hazardous or noxious potential uses to those surrounding properties that are already zoned T40. And staff finds that this does meet the intent of the land use regulations and the form-based code to provide a walkable mixed-use downtown core. So overall, staff recommends approval of this rezoning and planning commission voted to recommend approval as well. There is a representative from the applicant here today if you would like to hear from them. And other than that, happy to take any questions. Any questions from st uh, council for staff? Ms. Coker? Yeah, um, this, this letter saying that they're requesting to go to T5, is there somewhere in there that that's requested? That's the next request. The, oh, the is, next okay. case is the T5. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Jamie, I'd like to go back, I think, two slides. No, that one there. <laughs> so um, when you read 3.1.5.2, yes. and um, it says the, the rezoning request is a continuation of the T40 zoning that surrounds these few parcels. Mm -hmm. So was that something the staff felt to put in these few parcels? So uh, just the few, so the, the ones that are subject to the request, that's the few parcels. So the one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so, and again, it's consistent with what we've done, and I say we, not some of us, but others of us over the years, and I don't, um, with the Glacier Gates area and, and some of that, and the homeowners have sold already for the most part. Yeah, those. and so there will be, as you can see here, a few parcels will remain um, in the T4R uh, around it, um, but there are some, some parcel, like, to the south there, you can see there's already one that was, was left that way previously at one point. It's, it's not unprecedented to have those sort of remaining mm -hmm. parcels. Okay, any other questions before we bring the applicant up? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, I guess I'm um, just trying to understand because I do see, I am a little concerned that you've got one homeowner that's in the center of this, or one or two. And what are they going to be able to do with the T T four O that they can't do with the T four R? That's what this chart is here. Um, well, that's a lot yeah. of stuff. <laughs> you can't read. But I respectfully request in the future we break these into two slides so that they can be a little bigger. I know we can. I know we have the report in front of us, but if I was in the audience looking at that, I would be hard pressed. I can read the differences if you'd like. Um, it's predominantly um, T40 uh, allows retail building, display gallery, restaurant, um, kiosk, which I'd have to look the definition quite honestly, um, a sidewalk cafe, a special use lounge, um, secondhand store, um, the special use exhibition center, Theater, movie theater, museums by special use, indoor amusement by special use, outdoor amusement by special use, um, outdoor auditorium by special use, passenger terminal by special use. You'd also need a transit stop, um, a playground, sports stadium by special use, surface parking lot. Oh, that's that would be a, sorry. That's either way. Um, there, I, I do want to point out there is um, service, some auto uses, but I believe that the future land use category would prohibit those, even though they are, they're stated in the zoning, but they are preempted by the uh, comprehensive plan. Um, There's a lot of special uses on there uh, that, yes. that would never be approved by any council, and I can say that. A funeral home or a cemetery I look at that we always talk about that that would never be approved. No, but uh, there's a lot of stuff on here that's really going away. I know you say this is the future land use is urban village, which is predominantly supposed to be residential. But some of that, I mean, I think it's reasonable for a homeowner that's been there for 30 years mm -hmm. to not necessarily want to all of a sudden, you know, 
be in the middle of a commercial district? The future land use category is residential and residential supporting retail commercial. It's meant to be a mixed use area. Uh, oh, I thought it was the current zoning of T4R is is meant to be predominantly residential. It was an urban village. It is urban village. Future land use. Okay, which is predominantly residential. Which residents are you talking about? Well, there's, I mean, in that one, there's, you're talking, the shaded ones are the applicants, and the right. ones that aren't shaded. Can you go back to that picture? Are probably these people there. Yeah. See at the corner of 10th and Riverside, or the other, I mean, mm -hmm. all these ones that aren't shaded, I, I am assuming that's these people. I the, don't know. the ones in teal are T4R. The ones in pink are already T4O. Okay. Urban Village, as the future, the underlying future land use category, states desired uses include small light, lot single family, multiple family row houses, mid-rise housing types, professional and medical offices, restaurants, retail stores, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Mr. Perry. Jimmy, yeah, I mean, maybe you can explain a little bit about the future land use opposed to the current how is that determined? So the future land use is um, every property has both, right? So the future land use, uh, there can be a variety of zoning districts in one particular future land use. The future land use is a more broad categorization, and then certain um, zoning districts are appropriate in certain future land use districts. Uh, we don't here have a, a crosswalk. at. at I'm just going to use the example of like the county they have in their codes. It's like, oh, if your future land use is this category, then these are the zoning districts that would make sense. Um, your future land use uh, is also going to dictate your density and your intensity. So the Florida area ratio for a commercial use and your, you know, how many units you can put per acre for residential use. And when was the future land use determined and how was it determined for the city? Because it seems to me that if I'm microphone, a, please. Oh, sorry, if I'm in one of these teal, teal areas and to um, uh, Councillor Coker's point. Pull it a little closer. If you there's don't an, move that microphone, I'm I will sorry. move there's, it for there, you. <laughs> there's an expectation about a continued use, but you also know that in the future it can change, i.e., future land use. Mm -hmm. And so, how is how is that done throughout planning process and our zoning process? I think when we did. Our was that I, when we did the form-based code? Yeah, well, the, yeah, the form-based code, That's excuse me, was, was 2011 there. was the initial adoption. Yeah. Um, I don't know when this comp plan was adopted. Comp plan, pro well, comp planning probably started back in the 80s. Well, yeah. yeah, and so uh, <laughs> when they established, I'm not exactly sure when they established the um, urban village. Can you go back to the slide that shows the future land use so that we're clear on... Uh, uh, wrong way, sorry. Yeah. So just to be clear, when we talk about future land use, we're talking about comprehensive plan designation. They have to comply with the more restrictive of either the zoning or the land use. So if the land use in this case is more restrictive than the zoning, they have to comply with that. So if Urban Village is saying that those are the uses, the retail and restaurants and that kind of thing that are allowed, and it doesn't list automotive uses as being appropriate, then they would have to restrict with that even if the zoning allowed for that even under a special use process you wouldn't be able to do that because your future land use is going to be more restrictive in that case i don't know if that answers the question but that's um so you have that protection uh to say that not all of those uses that are permitted even by special use in the the zoning designation are necessarily going to be able to be there because of the future land use designation under the comprehensive plan yes ma'am uh, i i okay now that i'm looking at this like is there was there any reasoning as to why that was carved out i mean it looks like if everything around it was already, do, I mean, do you have any uh, any they idea? Had just been at at the time the current owners, you know, of single family homes were looking at, um, okay, you know, maintaining their homes and, uh, and some of that that you see to the east as part of the Shoreview um, project and and perhaps as part okay. of that project, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a broader uh, look at what kinds of uses would be allowed. Okay. So, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, some of that land we actually traded. We owned some of it as a city, and we traded it 
to get to this point because that's what the, the future development was talking about. And, you know, with our property on um, Glacier Gates East and Mineral Springs was all part of some of the land swaps and different things. <coughs> Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, would you say that Urban Village is more restrictive than T? Oh, tier. Wait. Yeah, I think as Jamie okay. indicated, that not entirely. But you want to go ahead. Wait. Well, so Urban Village is a future land use designation. Okay. So T4R and T4O are both allowable under. I mean, they're both throughout the city in that future land use designation. I guess I'm trying to get at if we permitted the rezoning mm -hmm. to T4R. I'm sorry, O. Um, but we, you would say that we still would be restricted in use and special uses because of the future land use of urban village. They would still be subject to what the urban village says. So if urban village says auto-oriented uses are not allowed, outdoor storage is not allowed, then they will not be able to do those things, even if that use table under T4O states they can. All right. Any other questions of Jamie and Robin, or we'll move on to the applicant? All right. Thank you. Let the applicant have some time. Good morning, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Margaret Tusing, and I'm a senior planner with CNS Engineering, and I have been sworn. And also with me today is uh, Troy Seifert, who is with MRW Associates, and we're here representing them. And we're going to do each case individually. Okay. As Jamie mentioned, this property is what is currently owned. This one. Okay, thank you. I don't have it in front of me, do I? Um, this is the property that is currently owned by Ms. Tusing, Ms. you're really going to need to use the microphone. Is this better? Yes, thank you. Was I not on the microphone before? You're fine, yeah. It, okay, okay. So this is the property that is in question, the ones that are hash marked, and they're in the teal, which is the T4R zoning district. Mr. Seipert, or MRW, also owns these parcels that are checked. And as Jamie stated, they did a, the staff did a good presentation, and most of the area here is zone T4O. Our rezoning is approximately 1.27 acres of that property. The properties have an underlying future land use designation of urban village. The TR4 zoning is more restrictive for commercial uses. It doesn't allow retail, office buildings, cafes, or restaurants and it's more focused on residential and limited commercial. We are requesting the T4O zoning. It does not increase any density nor the intensity of the site because that is controlled by the future land use category, which Ms. Schindelwolf mentioned. The T4O expands the permitted commercial uses to include offices, retail, galleries, restaurants, and cafes. This request is consistent with the majority of the zonings in the surrounding properties, and it is more consistent with the urban village future land use, which encourages professional and medical offices, retail stores, restaurants, and personal services. The applicant intent is to construct a restaurant, a cafe, and retail uses on these parcels. And Mr. Seipert is also here if you have any questions for him. Any questions for Mr. Seifert? All right. Anything <coughs> else? All right. The applicant still. My name's Carl Callahan, 114 uh, 25th Street West, and I'm here. Hold the mic up. How about that, Mr. Bray? Way up there. <laughs> um, representing the applicant. And one of the things that f the request for this is when the city did the river walk, one of the ideas was to try to amenitize the river walk. Mm -hmm. And if you look at urban village was there a long time ago, 
uh, form-based code is what has changed things to be T4O, T4R. When all those properties were acquired for the very original plan that was down on the Riverwalk, I mean, we're talking 20 years ago, and then when the Riverwalk came into B, uh, we did West Side, one of the amenities, Finally, we did east side, one of the amenities, and that's one of the reasons for this change is to be able to do that. Most of the single family homes are now gone. There are two that would remain. I think um, it, in a lot of those areas, you can see the compatibility. We have restaurants, we have retail, we have office next to residential virtually all over the city. It's all in the way it's done. It's all in the way you restrict or, or control it that really uh, makes all the difference in the world. You can have a, a crazy application and you would say no. You can have great applications and say yes. Restaurants are, are things that we obviously heard today. <laughs> we like restaurants with a bar application, not a bar. Mm -hmm. And we like retail, we like mixed juice. And that's the intent to try to, to, try to activate and, and, revital, and vi revitalize or make it happen on the Riverwalk East, so thanks. Any other applicant information before we go to the public hearing? Any questions? All right, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Good morning, please come forward, state your name and city of residence. Uh, yes, Dr. Paul C. Grievous, Esquire, 106 9th Street East, Braden in Florida, 34208. And um, what the applicants did not mention, and what they told to local media, is they have every intention of building a daiquiri deck. A daiquiri deck is not a little shop or restaurant. It is a full liquor bar that happens to serve some food along with it. And perhaps that would be okay in other areas. At first blush, the area in question looks very similar to 6th Street East, where, where daiquiris, I mean, sorry, daiquiri, where uh, caddies is at the, the end of that. But the problem, I'm putting my risk assessor's hat on, that was my life before being an attorney. The problem is there is only one potential collision point between pedestrians and motorists, and that is the ingress and egress to that parking lot for caddies on 6th Street. Um, since a picture is worth a thousand words, I drove around the neighborhood this morning, so you kind of see what you're kind of dealing with in that area. Okay, I guess I'm not going to be best for you on this, pull this up. But um, regardless, um, this is under the best of circumstances. This is the point of ingress for a lot of folks that were coming in on 10th Street. Is there a way to magnify this? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, certainly. Oh, Zoom, okay, my mistake. Um, so this is the point of ingress. This is on 10th Street East, just north of Manatee Avenue. There's a side street to the left. That is where, um, for, on the weekends, a lot of people go to the uh, comic book store there, Bat City Comic Professionals. Thank you so much, ma'am. And then going further up this road, you'll notice there's parking on one side. There was initially parking on both sides, but that became too much of a constriction of the road. So most of these people that are parked on that side of the road actually reside in the apartments across the way. So there's plenty of opportunities for collisions, interactions, if you will, between, between overserved motorists and pedestrians as they're coming across that road. Sometimes they're difficult to see under the best of circumstances, stuck in behind cars. Uh, going further up 10th Street, there's the park. And there's a crossing area for the park um, that's outlined. But also further up, there's also other parking areas, other crossing areas people are going to and from in some of these parking spots. There's a lot of opportunities for people under the best of circumstances <coughs> where you might have a potential for a collision with pedestrians. Again, I'm doing, I took these pictures this morning is during the slowest, quietest times. No people stopping suddenly, no looky-loos, no people parked illegally, hither, tither, and yon. This is as good as it gets. Uh, this is going further up, so you see some of those parking spots and people cutting across. The, the, you'll see it coming back around, that the sidewalk suddenly stops and people, pedestrians, have to walk on the street. And you're right, sorry about the glare. There's apartments to the right. This is on 3rd Avenue coming around 10th Street uh, Drive. A lot of people park in these spots and go to and from the apartments. You have a lot of people coming from the park to the apartments. There's a lot of opportunities for potential <coughs> collisions under the best of circumstances, not even somebody who might be overserved. Again, coming around the side where you're about to turn onto 10th Street Drive, um, there is an excess point, there's an exit sort of point. There are several opportunities up and down these roads for people to get injured. There are some areas where there's no sidewalks. There will be collisions between 
overserved patrons and pedestrians. Okay, thank you. thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you. Please state your name and uh, city of residence, and you have three morning, minutes. Mary and the staff. Uh, my name is Lydia Copeland McNeil. I live at 1002 Third Avenue East, and I agree with this gentleman wholeheartedly. He took the small part of where people are parking, and if you come down my street on Third Avenue, most of the time the right side of the um, roadway is full. Kids running across, and um, I even brought it to the um, the park people, uh, park maintenance out there, there's no crosswalk where the kids have to go to the park, number one. And then on the far end where they have the Glacier Park um, in the corner there, um, there's no crosswalk to say, and I think there needs to be a speed limit on that road and, and, and just like you said. And where are these people going to park when they bring all of this there? Can't park on the river unless they're coming by boats, you know. And uh, so there's no no place to park, and and uh, and then I just you know have another problem. When I mean, you got more, you have more space for the dogs to run around than the kids to play in that little corner. So I'm my, I'm just curious why the park was not put in Glacier Park like it should have been, um, but in, instead of being tucked in the corner. And I don't see many people walking because the dogs are running loose most of the time. And I even questioned the maintenance guy about uh, about the. Uh, a fence in a dog park I ever been to had a fence. He said it's not a dog park. I say so. Why are these all these dog garbage cans or there to, for dog? You know, and they have little slots to pull out the poop. And uh, so my question is, you know, I think it's just going to be a it's going to be crazy around there with old added cars coming in uh, and the people from the apartment parking where the park people need to park. Uh, it's just become a an issue um, so I just you know I'm not for it I'm right. against it okay thank you thank you anyone else wishing to speak please state your name and a city of residence good morning my name is Ron Allen 2822 review Boulevard Drive city of Bradenton and I have been sworn um, I, I want to make two quick points. One is I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, I think, Mr. Callahan's comments about when we originally started the Riverwalk in downtown, we were really trying to amenitize it. Um, and we were a little bit hum, hamstrung because of other activities that were along the waterfront that we couldn't bring that retail component to the area. So now we have downtown, which is the Riverwalk and has amenities. We have caddies in the middle, um, Madison's and caddies in the middle. And then as we go east, there were really very few opportunities to amenitize that, the river walk. Um, and I think it's really important that people have the ability to be able to walk along the river walk and be able to stop, enjoy the river walk for a, a longer period of time. The other thing I will take exception um, uh, to I think the first uh, comment that was made in the public. Um, if you look at the daiquiri deck and use that as an, a specific example, that's a restaurant that serves alcohol. That is not a bar that serves alcohol and or serves a little bit of food. They have a wonderful menu. If you haven't been to there, um, their menu first, um, restaurant first, alcohol as a secondary. Wonderful uh, component to the Riverwalk. And I think that sort of brings that amenitized area to the east side of the community. And there are a lot of residents in there. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to have not only walkability from uh, just the, river, the Riverwalk itself, but all the communities that surround that area. I just think it would be a dynamic uh, conclusion uh, to that Riverwalk uh, East expansion that uh, was done by you all in a few years ago. So those are my two points. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? We'll close the public hearing. And um, I'm just going to, a couple of things that I wrote down. Um, obviously, we do not have a dog park and we have a leash law. So if somebody is breaking that law, obviously we have to take care of that. And you know, so I would hope that you would let the police department know um, at a time. And um, we're having an issue over in Ward 2 where a gentleman 
has been trespassed in a park that he's letting a dog run free, and if he gets caught again, which people are sending me videos, he will be trespassed from the park and won't be allowed. So Glacier Gates and those parks, both of them on the one side of the road with the uh, ch children's equipment, more of it, and then the bigger open area for kids can play soccer, football. We actually put field turf there that, you know, we wanted it to be more of a passive park but where people could utilize it. So if, if dogs are breaking the law or the owners are breaking the law, we need to address that. So, um, and you do put the bags so when people are walking their dogs, they'll pick up the dog um, poop. Uh, the crosswalks is something that if we don't have them, we should have them. So, I mean, I would hope Mrs. Moore would address that at some point and get with the staff and, and Mr. Perry and get the crosswalks because safety is a very important. And then um, I know the chief just walked out of the room and I know it's been done since day one. All of the apartment parking is supposed to be on the apartment property. If they're parking on the street, we need to address that more aggressively. We've been addressing it and chief has been talked with and Captain Thiers. Um, there's a person that just this past week that sent an email that around the corner there that people were parking on Riverwalk um, a Riverside Drive East, and it's a rental place, you know, so people are renting their houses out to numerous numbers of people, and they don't have enough parking on their Airbnb. property. Is it a They're, rental or an Airbnb? I'm not sure, but it's not, it's not, most of those over there are not homeowner occupied. They're doing some things, but, but we're having issues with the vehicles, which we are addressing that in a way, but um, we actually had to put when it opened because when you live in an apartment complex, you have so many parking places. Well, if you're having more cars, then you try to park them on the street and we put three hour parking for the park area. But if we need to address that, I'll take care of that with Chief Bevan because cars just can't park and block views and other things that, you know, don't need to be there and they can't park for more than three hours in some of those and that street you know, I'm glad he brought that up because, you know, it's something that, you know, we're not trying to make it hard for a lot of people, but if safety is the concern, we need to get that street open because I agree with you, they were parked on both sides. We created the signs on the one side, we will create the signs on the other side. So it is, certain things need to be addressed that are correct. So I appreciate all of that. Um, questions from the council for staff? The applicant to readdress. The applicant has an opportunity to come up if there's no questions. We have comments, but okay. not questions necessarily. All right, so maybe the. A couple questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please state your name and address, or name and city of residence for the record. Hi, my name is Troy Seipert. I live at 5117 Sandy Cove Avenue, Sarasota, Florida. Um, thank you today for having me in front of you all. And one of the things that was brought up in the discussion is whether the Daiquiri Deck is a restaurant or if it's a bar. Our branding is Daiquiri Deck probably doesn't help me in my name to convey food, but I've asked or given to the clerk or to pass out to you guys uh, our menu. So I get to kill two birds with one stone. I get to present to you guys that we are actually a restaurant more than we are a bar. We sell more food than we do alcohol. At the same time, I get to advertise our menu. And <laughs> I get to advertise the fact that if we were just a straight bar, we would not we would not have a a CIA trained chef. Now, when I say that, I don't mean Central Intelligence Agency, but I mean Culinary Institute of America. His name is Jeremy Thayer. He's worked for IMG. He's worked for several chefs that are on Food Network. He was also one of the lead chefs at the Super Bowl two years ago. And the last day at the Super Bowl that was in Los Angeles, when he flew back, he became our corporate chef. We have really focused and put an emphasis on our food because that is what makes you sustainable. You discussed earlier about the bar issues that you have with straight up bars. That is, that does tend to be an issue. But when you have more than 51% of your food as your sales, you're not a, you're not a bar you're a bar with a restaurant. And that's the biggest emphasis of what we are. When I started looking at this area, what attracted me to it was the fact that you guys were developing the Riverwalk. 
I started looking in this area, and actually the first area I looked at was where you ended up putting Mineral Springs Park. That was over 10 years ago. Then you all traded the property with a gentleman so that you ended up with the property on Riverside Drive. Riverside Drive now has over 400 apartments just the south of it. You also have other, other apartment complexes within walking distance. And one of the big things that attracted me to this area is you can have a mixed use in it. And with a river walk, you have a very active river walk. You have things that you do down towards the city area with the skate park, volleyball courts, Madison's, Madison's, which we're just like. We're just like Madison's. You don't have anything like that on the east end. And so what I was looking at with my restaurant and potentially other type of commercial activities, such as a breakfast place, coffee shop, sundry store, those types of things that could be along the boardwalk that create the energy and activities that are positive for an area. If you live in the apartment buildings just to the south of us and you have a restaurant place you can walk to, you have a coffee shop, ice cream store, restaurant, those are amenities that attract people to your community and attract people to your area. And that's what we're looking at trying to provide here for you guys today. Thank you. I think another thing to think about, and then we'll go to Ms. Moore and then Ms. Barnaby, Vice Mayor Barnaby, is we're trying to make our city more walkable. And sometimes things that are on our river walk and can be walkable is important. And, you know, we do have to, to weigh a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things that I want to ask Ms. Singer or, or, or Jamie maybe, obviously any business that has to, or will build, will have to supply their parking. So it won't be just a business with a building and then parking wherever you can get it. They'll have to come up with a plan to have parking right. for the number of seats in their restaurant. Yes. So that's something to be addressed. Again, sometimes in the past we've gone and given some people some opportunities to have parking or, or you know, where the city helped them with it, but in this case they're gonna have to do their own parking. Yeah. I mean, I'm not aware of any plans for city parking in the proximity that would assist them, so. Okay. Mr. Mayor, before yeah. Ms. Singer leaves, my question was, you know, we're just dealing with land use and that sort of thing now. Whatever project they want to bring back to us, can we require that they do a parking study? Um. I mean, certainly we can prevail upon them to do a parking study. I mean, I guess it depends what. Yeah, it would depend upon what they were putting there yeah. and how much that sort of thing. But um, that's not something that we deal with right now. Yeah. Because of what what our actions in front of us are right now. What right. We, have we to can't deal with do now. anything as part of a rezone. But if someone is brings a project forward, we can talk with them about different other things that they might consider looking at yeah I think um, it would be an administrative approval for the most part they're gonna have to supply their parking as the mayor said mm -hmm. uh, they'll probably have to go through a site improvement plan process uh, to develop the property and through that they're going to show us where the parking is located um, from what I'm understanding you to say the concern would be overflow parking and how that would impact the adjacent neighborhood uh, and certainly that's part of our concern as well uh, that we would be looking for a full complement of parking um, in close proximity so that they're not uh, impacting the neighborhood thank you Ms. Moore um, I, I want to preface my comments with um, I don't think it's any secret to you all that or to staff that it is my goal for this area to move towards that urban village. Um, it makes absolute sense to me that the east side is, the northeast side is the natural progression as we expand and activate the down, what we call the downtown core. Um, I also agree strongly that this area is devoid of amenities and I, I want the Riverwalk to have those type of amenities. Um, I want to make absolutely clear though what we're doing. What we just previously take, or no, I'm sorry, continued was a special use permit, and we do have uh, authority to add stipulations to that. We do not have that with a rezone. We can ask them, we can prevail upon them, as Ms. Singer said. But when we rezone, they are permitted to do whatever they are permitted to do within that rezone. So I just don't want us to make decisions based on assurances and hope 
and then later be disappointed, it is very possible that their complete plan could change for many reasons. Um, that said, again, like I said, though, I am, I am in support of this area having more amenities. Um, my only, my real concern is what Mr. Grievous um, raised, which is I, I also feel that this is very tight from a not parking, whatever their, whatever their zone to do, staff will work with them to determine whatever our code says that that project requires, what, however many parking units or spaces based on unit and project but it is actually the flow of traffic. Those, these streets, and I'll raise the same concerns when we get to the next matter, are super tight. And I don't think that that is on the applicant necessarily. I mean, perhaps staff can speak to what we can ask of them when they're eventually going to do any zoned approved project. Um, but I think it, it behooves us to do some kind of, to commit to you know, for us to support this, for us to commit as a body to a separate action that looks at this area for safety purposes because 10th Street, Riverside, uh, and 9th, and 10th Street Court East, all of this here does have a lot of safety issues. It has a lot of very narrow roads, a lot of on-street parking, a lot of curves that are very tight because of the on-street parking. Um, I did not realize about the sidewalk crosswalk, but I, I'm going to investigate that as well with staff. So that is kind of where I'm at. I want to support the project. I want to support this type of project in this area. I think that the um, it's just the natural progression, and it will ultimately, despite you know, disrupting a, a couple of parcels, I think ultimately it is the natural thing that would benefit this area, and then I'll, by extension benefit downtown, and then by extension the entire city. Um, but those are my concerns, and I, I don't know what the next step is to get that assurance. I don't know if maybe Ms. Clayback can speak to a traffic uh, study of sorts or whatnot. Uh, let, uh, let me kind of go through a couple of things, and I, th I think I'm thinking this right, and Ms. Clayback can confirm it. A lot of times, and when we're going through it now, we have, you know, in our city areas have speeders that go down certain streets, and sometimes, the way we make the street slows the traffic down and obviously parking on the street that makes it difficult and some of the things that we have to do what's within the legal limits but some of those streets were built like that because they want people moving slower and a tighter street sometimes makes them move slower and you know obstacles because obviously we know through our fire department continually we'll push this not to have speed humps you know, and that's something we do. But but I think some of the designs are purposely designed to kind of slow traffic down. So that would be important to remember. Um, and I do think that, you know, some of the opportunities are there to improve the streets with some development, to improve our infrastructure with the developments where, you know, we know where we're working through a lot of infrastructure stuff underground that can help improve this at the developer's cost because they're going to have to do certain things where you know the city will take a lot longer to do it this will help speed that up and i think there's other i really feel that there's other things that will come in there that because old manatee is is you know ripe for development at this time and you know some of the things that are out there you know they're waiting for that first step to do the next step and there was even an area that, that, you know, anywhere in Old Manatee, there's no parking. You know, when you look at Oscura, when you look at Central Cafe, you know, so hopefully there's an opportunity for something to be some more parking at somebody else's expense that can help then drive, you know, opportunity because you like to park somewhere and walk and be a walkable more community um, I think some of these things also, you know, we love the Riverwalk and we love help supporting the businesses on Manatee Avenue, but the ultimate goal of Riverwalk is to be on the river. And there's opportunities down the road as some of these things happen to continue it on the river. Um, and there's also, and I'm gonna say this because it, you know, we had an opportunity a few years ago that uh, really was a good opportunity until someone really did some not right things to kill it, but we had an opportunity to get an, an east-west 
corridor there to still you didn't have to get on to Manatee Avenue. And I'm confident that that's coming back because if you go from by Caddy's, you have to go to Manatee Avenue, right. turn right, <laughs> turn left. So if we can make that where we do have maybe just a, a, a bike and walking friendly area plus a one way east, so you wouldn't have to get on Manatee Avenue to go east from the hospital, mm -hmm. I think that's huge. And I think that opportunity has is in the process of coming back up for us. I am which, happy to hear that yeah. because yes, that is, I, I hate that jog on Manatee Avenue. It's super dangerous. I ride my bike mm -hmm. and walk right. that area right. frequently. That's working, but you know, it's an opportunity that, that you continue to, to help. As we know, I'm gonna say it, Ms. Coachman, government works slow. Yes. <laughs> I just my, my main focus is again really wanting to encourage the you know what I, I really that is that's my vision for this area and the northeast side I think is just it is because of the way that downtown is kind of hemmed in on the west to some extent and the south has Lecom to me this east side is going to be the natural way that our, as downtown grows that's just going to be the flow of it um, and this area really does need, I, I think that some, you know, I think it needs economic drivers. So I think that Riverwalk was a great start. And now when we start to add some amenities, I, I, and I hear that from people. I hear people say, why isn't there food on the Riverwalk? Um, but, but again, to the point, I mean, it is, I just drove it this past weekend and those streets are narrow and that parking is actually happening. And because the rezone, because the thing before us is just a yes or no, my concern is, you know, I want to say yes. I, I very much want to say yes. But I, I need some assurance that we are actually going to, and I, I know government moves slow, but I, I can't suffer this. I can't have us go ahead with this project that I want. I do want it um, without knowing that it's going to take 10 years to make the street safer, you know, in the interim. So I just, and I know we can't tack it on. You know, I can't put that on them. It's a rezone. So... Today, I can't say, help me make that corridor safer. I don't have the ability to put that uh, stipulation on the approval. We do control parking on the street and all of that, so that will be addressed immediately. And I've got our police chief back there and our Mrs. Kleibeck that will be able to get that done. We have a sign shop, and that's something that I've wanted for a long time because I drive that street five times a week because we don't come down Manatee Avenue without turning right at every street down Manatee Avenue from um, the river and drive it and see it and mm -hmm. see what's happening because it's important that we see and see the people at the park, see the people at all of it and talk to people and they want stuff and that's what, you know, what's happening and that's, so it's important, you know, I mean, it's it's what's happening. It's what we we can revitalize old Manatee, which turns into Riverwalk, which turns into Main Street, which turns into Village of the Arts, which turns into Lecom. Yep. And all of the projects that we're doing now, City Park starts that. Other, you know, from that end. And how do we engage that? This is one of those engagements that, you know, I believe the public wants. You know, and there's some angst I, you know, I feel for certain areas because, yeah, it's my backyard at times. You know, people say it's my backyard, but growth is inevitable in our city. And how do we make it walkable? You know, how do you, if you go to Richard Florida's, you know, book that talks about walkable neighborhoods, well, you know, anywhere in big cities, they would walk from Riverwalk East to Lecom because it's what a city does. In our city, we don't have enough amenities in between to make that worthwhile. We have one of the best amenities in Riverwalk, but there's some gaps in it that, you know, that's set up. So, um, no, I appreciate that. Ms. Coachman, you had something? Yes, thank you. Um, there are other areas in the city right now. We also need to put some signs up in terms of parking. Um, I am all for development you know, in, in progress in the city. But my main concern is public safety and quality of life of people that'll be living 
around this. So I'm all I'm all for development, obviously, but I just definitely don't want to lose sight of public safety. And unfortunately, when we're these kinds of votes are in front of us, it's that trust factor that you've got to trust that down the road, you know, with the developer and the city, we could work out some things. Um, but of course, it's not required if if the zoning has changed. But I just have that trust factor um, that I usually work on to um, look at things like this, property, you know, situations like this when you you're kind of iffy about it because you know it's going to impact somebody. Uh, so you're going to try to minimize that as much as possible. So just wanted to add that. I've been hearing right. everybody say that, but I just had to add. Thank you, Ms. Coker. Yeah, um, I, I, I realize we have to look down the road. I think we are getting a little bit beyond what our decision here is today. And I had heartburn at first about some of this. But when you look, the plan was for that whole thing to be zoned at the T4O. I don't, it, it's beyond reason to me as to why that would have been carved out like that. And I feel like we're almost just making it the way it should be. I think all of these are valid concerns that will need to be addressed in future decisions. And obviously everyone here knows our concerns for safety, public safety is first. But in terms of um, planning, I mean, the growth is going to happen, and what we want to do is plan it so that it happens in a good way. And I think this decision today to go will make that more consistent for that whole area. And uh, so, I, I, you know, while I was concerned up front I'm, through this whole process, I feel a lot better about it. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess at this point, Chair will entertain a motion. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion. Okay. Uh, hold on, let me get back to my thing. Ugh. Sorry. Mrs. Melton, can you state the motion? It was motion, motion to, approve, to the approve ordinance 4025. Okay, so it's a motion by Ms. Coker. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Kramer? We've had a lot of discussion. Any final discussion? May I? Yes. Um, I just, I really want to reiterate that I just would like some reassurance, I guess. I know, I know you can't commit to anything formally, <laughs> but I just can't. I, I want this, to be clear. But I just would love some assurance that it's not going to take 10 years to fix it. <laughs> Ms. Moore, I think the assurance that, that you're going to have is working within this council and this administration to make sure that if there's any street improvements that need to go up to there, mm -hmm. that we get that done. Because again, if you like you're saying, it's not on the applicant, but again, that's going to be a team effort yes. from, you know, working through things. And I agree with you, so we can make that happen. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, I'm hearing no further discussion. We'll start the vote in Ward 5. Yes. 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yes. 4. Yes. Carries 5 to 0. Thank you. Moving on. Jamie. Um, hold on. Oh, thank you. That was just something the applicant brought up from the last case. Wanted to make sure it got on the record. All right, um, again, Jamie Schindelwolf with the planning department and I have been sworn here to present the staff report for the second case, LU 23.4561. This is a request, there are two requests contained um, in this, this one application. The first is for a zoning atlas amendment from T4O to T5 for some parcels and then it's also a request to remove some properties from the antique overlay district. 
So the hashed um, parcels you can see here are the subject of these requests. The ones that are outlined in that bold sort of yellow orange are the ones that are proposed to rezone. And then the ones that have that cross hatching are the ones that are proposed to be removed from the antiques overlay district. Here you can see the zoning and the future land use for the overall area as it stands today. Um, there is that UV future land use as we just discussed the urban village um, located to the east of 9th Street and then to the west of 9th Street that's uh, got a future land use designation of urban central business district. So that future land use includes uh, the central business district, river walk and the west historic district. Um, these sub areas form the downtown of the city and provide a vital place for social, cultural and economic interchange is what our comprehensive plan states. And as we've already discussed, Urban Village um, uses that are listed in the uh, future land use and the general character of a district with a distinct sense of place and walkable environment supporting and enhancing abutting neighborhood areas. These are the two requests as stated and I will go through them one by one. So the first request is to rezone these properties here from T40 General Urban Open to T5, um, which is our urban center zone. The T4 General Urban Zone consists of a mixed use but primarily residential urban fabric, has two different subzones as we just discussed. In this case, these are zoned T40, that more open zoning district. The T5 zone, uh, consists of higher density mixed use buildings that accommodate retail offices row houses and apartments but it is similar in use allowance to T40 and we will get to that in a moment here are some photos of the neighborhood primarily single-family homes with some vacant lots there are a couple duplexes Glazer Gates Park is nearby the eastern portion of the river walk So again, sorry it's small, um, <laughs> but there are fewer differences this time. And I did highlight the things that are different between T40 and T5. A uh, major difference in use allowance is that hotels are permitted in T5, while greenhouses and veterinary clinics are not. Uh, there are some additional uses that would be allowed by special use in T5. Um, I'm seeing auto sales rental, but that's again one of those situations where it's prohibited by the comp plan so it wouldn't it, it actually would not be allowed here in this area um, but a convention center or a conference center could possibly be allowed but that would be through special use would come before the board um, t5 is an appropriate zoning district overall in uh, areas that are in the ucbd future land use it is the most intensely developed area of the city as stated I also want to talk about height for a second. Um, T40 zoning allows for a pre-bonus height of up to three stories with all possible bonuses that you can see here. Um, the tallest a building could be in T40 would be six stories. In T5, um, the maximum pre-bonus height is five with um, 12 stories after all of these bonuses are fulfilled. So you can see um, they can get two stories if they dedicate 25% of the building square footage for workforce housing. Contribute extra to public art, they can get a story. So that's how that would work theoretically. Um, and the recent time limited height incentive bonus that was approved would not be applicable to these T5, if, if this does get rezoned to T5 um, properties because this is outside of the boundaries of that ordinance. Pardon me. Yeah. Could you speak to what the Live Local Act would could do, whether it's T40 or T5? Hmm. I'm gonna let Robin speak to the Live Local <laughs> Act. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't change whether it's T40 or T4 or T5. Both are mixed use districts, right. and therefore it would apply equally to either one. Okay, but T well, what the Live Local does is if you have at least 40 percent affordable housing in your project then you get the maximum I believe it's the maximum height allowed within one mile and the maximum um, density allowed within the city 
So that's that, regardless. That's that's regardless. That's yeah. That was a gift <laughs> from the state legislature. Yeah. So okay. we don't. That doesn't uh, impact this. Well, providing what happens there. Right. Okay. So again, looking at those uh, criteria from the Land Use Atlas District for a, an amendment, um, staff finds T5 is consistent with the future land use category. Many areas are zoned T5 with that future land use. Um, staff finds that it is a continuation of existing T5 zoning and that 9th Street East would divide the area of T5 from the existing T40. Um, they both allow most of the same uses and we've discussed the height allowances. The rezoning doesn't increase allowed density or intensity because that still is governed by the future land use. Um, and the rezoning request does not introduce hazardous or noxious uses that may negatively impact surrounding properties. Staff finds this request meets the intent of the land use regulations and form based code meant to promote a walkable mixed use urban downtown core. So based on this criteria, staff recommends approval of the rezoning request from T40 to T5. The second portion of this application is a request to remove these hash parcels um, from the antique overlay district. These are mostly located in the uh, UCBD future land use with those two on the east side of 9th Street East um, under the urban village future land use. So this is a chart that comes out of the form based code. It's also found in the land use regulations, but the, um, this overlay is only found in the form based code area. Um, and it appears that the intent is to limit the properties that are subject to this overlay to the uses that are located in this chart instead of the full use table. Though the entire, um, excuse me, um, there is, if you're aware, in the form based code, a column that states uses um, for, in addition to this, there's another whole column with uses in the um, land development regulations, but the form based code states that the land use regulations aren't to be used for permitted uses within the form based code. So this is, this is really what we would be looking at for this area. The purpose of the, the district is to encourage appropriate home occupation and home business uses oriented toward or supporting an antique collectibles theme is what's stated. Um, the orange area here outlined in black is the entire extent of the antique overlay district. Um, this was approved by city council in 2005. The staff analysis wrote that Again, the, the purpose was to create a successful theme-based environment around antiques and furniture, which nurtures the development of a sound, sustainable economic base for revitalization. Um, this is some other excerpt, another excerpt from um, 2013. The form-based code was adopted <coughs> in 2011, and the antique overlay district and other overlays were not included. In 2013, historic districts, village of the arts overlay, and the antiques overlay district were added to the form based code. Um, and so all of the properties that are under this are already zoned T40 or T5, which permit live work units by right. The inclusion of the AOD uh, appears to limit the types of live work units allowed in the area, but staff is not aware of any applications that have sought to take advantage of the privileges afforded by or the theming of that AOD. Um, zoning the properties T40 and T5 initially seemed to indicate interest for more intensive redevelopment in the area, but the intention of adding the AOD back into the form based code is a bit unclear because there's very limited staff evaluation in the reports we were able to find. Um, it may have been meant to scale back the allowances. <coughs> Overall, again, looking at those criteria, uh, staff finds that removing the overlay doesn't create any inconsistencies with the comprehensive plan. Uh, there are many properties that are outside of the overlay that are T40 and T5 with the same future land use designations. Um, removing it will afford these properties the same development rights as many adjacent parcels. Um, the area in general, has a lot of properties that could already develop into any of the T40 or T5 uses and they're not subject to the overlay. 
It would not create unique incompatibilities if this overlay is removed from these parcels. Overall, the character of the area does, it has changed um, with the introduction of the apartments, river walk, et cetera. Again, this is not increasing density or intensity that's allowed and not introducing hazardous or noxious um, uses to the area. If the interest of the city is to restrict development in the area, removing the overlay will open this area to increased development. Overall, staff finds this consistent with the land use regulations and recommends approval of the removal of these parcels from the Antiques Overlay District. Um, and this is just a summary and points out that Planning Commission also recommended approval of both the rezoning from T40 to T5 and the removal of parcels from the Antiques Overlay District. Um, and I also want to state uh, that before the last case, you were handed um, one of those emails was in regard to this case. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, none of us were on the council or the mayor in 05 except for Ms. Barnaby. Yes. Um, so, Ms. Barnaby, um, I'm going to make a couple of statements that some information I found out from others that, and you can tell me if that's how you remember it, but um, in 05 there was kind of a, a neighborhood that was going a certain way with different... Uh, kind of businesses, things that were wanting to get in there and that were, weren't really what the neighborhood wanted. So they, they kind of did the overlay district um, and that's been almost 20 years and obviously nobody has utilized it, but it was basically to stop something else, hoping it might spark something and looking 20 years later, we don't think it did. So is that kind of what you remember from your what, time on? And I, don't, and I don't know how you voted either way, but I think I voted in favor of it, yeah. if I remember correctly, because I um, had a, many conversations not only with the then planning director, Tim Polk, but also with members of the community that lived in that area. And what, I know it got called the antiques overlay, what we were really looking at, but because of copyright couldn't use the term, the HGTV overlay, meaning this is, if you remember, if you think back in 2005, um, Chip and Joanna Gaines started, you know, on TV. There was a lot of people attempting to, like, buy furniture and do the shabby chic thing and reincorporate plants and that sort of thing back into their environment, um, unique designs of homes and redoing homes and and we wanted to encourage businesses that were going to lend themselves to that kind of of activity and atmosphere a lot of DIY activities do-it-yourself activities that sort of thing um, and we were trying to encourage because it was a historical neighborhood in the area we were trying to encourage the redevelopment of those craftsman houses and have that kind of, um, at one point they'd even talked about doing a separate um, public market, f farmer's market over in that area um, to kind of, again, encourage that, that HGTV gardens and do-it-yourself projects and that sort of thing. and. At that time, we thought we'd have you know people beating the door down to try to set up mm -hmm. some of those businesses and things because it, it, it was it was big, and I I wonder if we had named it something other than the Antiques District, if it had been a little more. Um, not sure the term I want to use. I think when pe when people hear the word antiques, they think of their grandmother's. Uh, Chesterfield and their doilies on things and that sort of things and and just the the true antique market has really dropped in value for years and years now the the service club of Manatee County used to have a three-day antique show and that was their big fundraiser and they because year after year several years ago it, it fell out of vogue they changed their 
their fundraising model and went to a single night event kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, there, there was, I, I think what the intent was, it's, it's laid fallow. Nothing's happened. So it didn't work, did it? <laughs> Mark. Well, that, that, was, that wasn't the main reason I asked that question, but <clears throat> the main reason was that I know there was some other type of businesses that were trying to move into some of that area, whether it be a lawn business and store 10 trucks in there. Right. And I was mean, trying it, to it stop was... something to see if something else would work, and 20 years later, it, it, it hasn't, hasn't worked. So, there, there were major mm. concerns about what was happening mm. in the area, and this was an experiment to try to see if it would would take off. Take off, and it didn't. So, all right. Um, any other questions for Jamie? Yes, Miss Moore. Um, I uh, all my all my comments on what my vision is for that area and safety concerns, especially this corner is actually worse than the other one. Um, still stand. Uh, I, uh, regarding the antique district overlay, I feel like it's very important. It took me many meetings with staff to really fully um, grasp this nuance of the antique district overlay, which is that it is not a preservation of the character or the architecture or the style. Um, I think that area is so, one of the values of that area is its history and, and its feel of being one of the oldest parts of the city. Um, and I was disappointed to learn that the antique district overlay does not, in fact, preserve anything regarding character of construction or whatnot. It literally just lets you live or sell antiques out of your home and of a handful of other miscellaneous businesses. I think a daycare is one of them and some other home-based businesses that it permits. Um, so that said, I, um, I, I Unfortunately, I agree with that assessment that while I appreciate the intent, I don't think that it gets to what we're currently really trying to do, which is to some extent preserve the character of the buildings and any future development, try to hold them to a preservation of character. We have to rely on the form-based code for that. And again, assurances and prevailing upon uh, development. Um, one of the things though that I wanna maybe ask Ms. Um, Schindewolf about is the only thing that concerns me is in this rezone because I do think it is, and also I'll just note too that this area has, what it has accomplished and part of its character that's so fun is it does have at least three uh, secondhand thrift shops. That's part of uh, the, you know, the coalition of, of business owners that are trying to brand themselves and really jumpstart some development in this area. So it does have that, you know, somewhat tech or antique secondhand uh, business, you know, I think eventually it could be an area where that's kind of where you go for that kind of thing because you can hit a few within walking distance. Um, the only thing that concerns me is the ability to have a special use for automotive. Um, and if you could speak to that with the future business, I mean, I'm sorry, the future. Um, land use? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, so they, while that is listed on the zoning table, the future land use prohibits it. Prohibit so that. that would not come before you. No, I think there are all special uses anyway, but they yeah, are. there would not be um, auto-oriented uses permitted. Okay. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Um, we'll let the applicant speak. Thank you. Good morning again, Margaret Tusing. And uh, Ms. Wolf did a very good job, so I don't have a lot to add about it. Um, I know that we were surprised about the Antique Overlay District and that it surpassed the zoning so it was kind of a surprise to our client and to us that one took precedent over the other but we did you know as staff requested us to do to apply for our properties at a minimum to be removed from the antiques overlay and again um this shows the rezoning the rezoning request and in addition, my client also owns these properties, again, checked. So he owns more than what is being requested to be rezoned. And primarily what they're looking to do in this particular area is to develop it residentially. And the T4, the, excuse me, the T5 zoning gives them additional height. Um, so because the density doesn't change, but the higher you go, the more units you can get. With a maximum of six meeting all um, 
bonus requirements is what you would have with the T40. The T5 allows you a minimum of five stories and 12 stories if you go up. Uh, we don't have specific plans, but that is the intent, is to do a residential project there. And uh, let's see. We believe that the T5 zoning is more consistent. As you can see, it certainly is in the surrounding area and that we're eliminating much of those parcels that are currently zoned um, T40. And for the Antiques Overlay District, again, it is an area, and I'm gonna highlight those that my client owns, which I think Ms. Schindelwolf also had on her map. So those are our properties, and we're requesting those to be removed from the AOD. And if you have any questions, my client is here, as well as Mr. Callahan, if you have any questions of them. Any questions? All right, Mr. Callahan. You want this one? Yeah, just leave it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Carl, Calla Carl Callahan, 114 25th Street West. Uh, and part of the question on the Antiques District, uh, I was here during that time, and uh, you gotta look at when it happened, it happened in association with Antiques District, with the Historic District over there, both of them in concert, which were falling kind of right after the successes of the Village of the Arts and Live Work. The primary focus on the Antiques District was that it was administrative approval, right? When, before it happened, you could not do those uses in that area. You had a single family home and you could not do it a Live Work or do that. And what it did change was the ability for the executive director of, of uh, the planning department to approve that use without going through a formal process because it was desired to do that. That was made it ease for people to do that. When you talk about what was there, you, the air conditioning business was there, the automotive businesses were there, and those were starting to proliferate, and it certainly was an attempt to say, hey, we not see more of those. Those aren't in keeping with anything that anybody wants to see, whether it's antique, historic, whatever it may be. So that was a little bit of what that was. When you look at this map here, certainly um, all of this area is already T5 and, and potentially has 12 stories. You're looking at the piece here that runs along that potentially could be that same height, but the most likely scenario is when you look at developments in that area, they have liner units, they have things that are necessary because you're gonna have parking, a lot of other issues come up. Also the beauty of this map, it shows you the complete ownership with the exception of Mr. Grievous' house is in control of this entity going on ninth. So when you want to expand to improve the access on ninth, you have a willing owner who is going to be wanting to help you because it's going to help their businesses as well. So you'll have accesses there. Also, and I had been working with Troy for over two years on, on this, these projects. And with this frontage on third, from day one, he had expressed an interest in working with the city, was very aware of the river walk, was very aware of the Third Avenue access issues and how to make those happen, and voluntarily put, said, I want my land to be part of being able to improve Third Avenue because it needs it. And he has a, a large parcel of being, being able to do that. Also, when we look at this plan, we know that going around doesn't work very well. If you look at the ownership interest in this area, county, Applicant. So the ability to make your third avenue come through like you really want it is there. And um, everybody knows that that's in the best interest of the east side, trying to tie that into second. And that's, <coughs> you know, people come here when, they, when the future developer comes, they're going to want things. Well, guess what? The city's going to want things as well. That's how it works. And certainly there is the availability to make those improvements that everybody thinks are necessary because of having one continuous ownership on those. So yes, um, certainly uh, I think it, it can happen. I think when this development happens, you will find that they, any developer will want to work on those because it's in their own their interest as well. To make circulation work, to make it look good, to make plenty of room for traffic, all of those things can happen in this area. So with the T5, you're gonna get kind of what you want. Gives a little bit of boost in density. Um, the height, you already have the height that comes all the way up to right there already. It's not, 
So what it will be in concert with the whole plan. How does it work together to make it, make it fit with the neighborhood? And then uh, just because you can't have 12, doesn't mean 12 is feasible, doesn't mean 12 is economically feasible, doesn't mean any of those things uh, as you move forward with the project. So I think that it, it's a win-win for, I think, everyone in this particular area. In the Antiques District, 19 years of nothing happening, I think, is pretty indicative of, of <laughs> where it stands. So, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comment by the applicant? I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak again. I just wanted to give you an illustration of all the properties that I've either purchased or have under contract currently in this neighborhood. I also have these two little properties right here under contract along with, and you guys were talking about uses in the neighborhood. I also have, I'm going to use this other map so you can see the property. Besides having these two little lots under contract along with the other properties, I also have, it's a roofing company. and. I don't know if you realize, but this whole area kind of, when you get west of Ninth Avenue, closer towards and south of Third Avenue, but you start to get in more like heavy industrial kind mm -hmm. of stuff. You got roofing company. One of the properties I have in their contract are these two properties right here, and it's currently occupied by a roofing company. So I'm in the process of working and trying to purchase the other houses in the neighborhood so that I basically end up having the whole area for development. At the same time, I mentioned earlier, the Riverwalk was what attracted to me. The only drawback to the Riverwalk was the fact that when you got to Caddy's, you have to go all the way up to Manatee Avenue. And for me, I mean, you go up to uh, Manatee Avenue and then you come back down 9th Avenue. Well, I own the properties on the west side of the street for the most part, except for the first three right off of Manatee Avenue, where I have them under contract. And then you have Third Avenue. For me, it's a benefit to shorten it so you don't have to walk all the way up to Manatee Avenue. I mean, that takes all the benefit of having a river walk when you got to walk on Manatee Avenue. I mean, we all like manatees, but you don't see them on Manatee Avenue. <laughs> so when I look at this, <clears throat> I want to get you guys back to the water as quickly as you can. And Third Avenue is a way to do that, along with coming down the west side of my properties between me and the marina potentially and get you right back on the water. That's assuming you can't get something worked out with the people that own Tarpon Point. If you do, I'll make the connection all the way around on the water. That's, that's what I want. So when you look at this and you look at what, um, you see what Carl talked about a few minutes ago, you guys are gonna have the opportunity, although this is a zoning and taking me out of the antique district. And don't get me wrong, I love antiques. My grandmother had an antique store. My mom had an antique store. Heck, I make, I forge my own stuff in my garage at home. I make necklaces and rings and stuff. But this, really, this area, that's not what this area is. And over 18 years, nothing got used with it. So when I look at it, I would like to do residential development on these parcels and then enable you guys to connect the river walk the way it needs to be done and then give you the circulations with 3rd Avenue to the other neighborhoods to the east. One of my goals and why I'm doing what I'm doing is to make this a better neighborhood. It's to improve the quality of the neighborhood. Continue doing what you guys are doing and that is redevelop your community. Make it a fun, livable environment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other applicant? All right, hearing none, open the public comment. This time we'll open the public comment. Anyone wishing to speak? Anyone wishing to speak? Please state your name and your city of residence and you'll have three minutes. Hi again, I am Lydia Copeland McNeil, 1002 Third Avenue East in Brainton. Um, I'm opposed to this, um, not opposed to the de development and bettering the neighborhood, but as far as, again, it's safety for me, being a former law enforcement officer I see it every day in front of my house. And to bring in all that traffic, more traffic, more density. Um, and I was here, I think it was, I don't remember if it was 2011 or 2014, Miss Bonneby was here. And um, they, they were talking about density. The, they, the road area, they put down the new pipes. There's lots of flooding still in the area. I've called out the, um, the, the truck to come, you know, drain it. 
because at the end of the road, the uh, water pile up at the end of the road on Third Avenue. Um, then they're talking about Third Avenue. If I remember correctly, Ms. Bonnaby, maybe you, you know, but <coughs> one of the stipulations uh, as far as the, the, everything that happened around me, that they were going to take Third Avenue, as he mentioned, that was supposed to go all the way through to Ninth. Mm -hmm. But they put a well, Tropicana already had a pond here, then they put another one here and just put a pathway, a sidewalk there. So for me to get out of my house, you go 10th Street, that's the only one to Manatee Avenue. Because if you try to turn right on that street, you got cars blocking that road too, okay? And, uh, and then you bring in all these other people in, where are they gonna go? They may have to go off the 9th or 10th, but bringing in that m many more people, especially with the new development that's already there, I think it's gonna be a problem. And like I said, my main thing is safety for our children and, um, and then if, uh, going back to the other thing, if they're going to be drinking, those kids run across the street to the park where they have, the, and you mentioned about the um, asphalt on, over there, not the asphalt, the turf, because that's one of the areas they have one of the play thing for the kids. Like I said, the other, all the other stuff is across the street, okay? That big field in front of my house, that's where the dogs go do their business. Some people pick up, some don't. They used to have people come throw the football, you know, older, the older crowd, the uh, teenagers and stuff, such. Soccer, they don't do that anymore because they're stepping in poop. So my, my concern, like I said, is the safety and the density and bringing more in. We're already flooding over there uh, still with the, all the redevelopment. Uh, so I would just say no again. All right, thank okay, you. Thank you. All right, anyone wishing to speak? Anyone else? Please state your name and your city of residence. Uh, Bill Sanders, Bradenton. Uh, I wasn't going to speak, but I've heard some things here that I'm highly questioning. Um, could you bring that map back up of uh, the area that we're talking about here? Um, the applicant had it. Uh, I want uh, uh, this, this area. I'm obviously very familiar with this because I live right there and I am opposed to uh, retail of a bar being in a neighborhood. You're talking about children, a parks there, and you're wanting to build a, a bar there, Mrs. Moore? You live there. You want your children to go down there and, 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 and run into some drunks or whatever? You know, is it really? I, I can't, I'd like for you to say that out loud. <clears throat> The other thing here, and we talk about this Third Avenue cut through. I tried to get the Third Avenue cut through in order to make it so you don't have to go back out to Manatee Avenue. And Mr. Callahan approached me that he wanted to vacate Riverview Drive. Is that still the case? Yeah, it is. That's exactly what this is headed. This is headed to where Riverview Drive along that street to Mr. Graves's house would be vacated because he, Carl Callahan came to me and said, let's vacate that and so we can bring this up to third. So yeah, he's negotiating for that right today. And that is not the right thing to do. That's not keeping a river walk. What we're doing is we're going around Caddy's, going up to third street, making the cut through and then going back down. And it, it, you're actually doing the opposite of what the intent should be for that river walk area. And I am 100% adamant to this, and I'm going to do everything I can to fight it. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? All right. Paul, uh, Paul Rebus, 106 9th Street East, Bradenton, 228. Again, the city talks about improvements. They talk about, they talk about Talk about you know these improvements and stuff, but the city itself is responsible for having, <laughs> for having narrowed down what was Broadway down to a 20-foot wide road. This is what the city. Did. <laughs> this wasn't like this, and now you're going to have presumably 12-story high-rises, and then you're going to have residential houses on the other side. You have 12-story high-rises with, if you recall, 
back in November, y'all passed an administrative order allowing for, with some basically administrative changes, being able to get up to 20 stories as of right. This is in the, that side of the road is actually in the UCBD. So we could potentially be looking at 20 story high rises, or at the very least, maybe 12 story high rises yeah. in this, on this narrow stretch of road with limited resources. And I know, Mayor Brown, you've always said you want the developers to pay for the resources, and that's great for you know, the, the utilities. I mean, our sewer system is a joke. It's 100 years old, it's band-aided. But regardless, that road is still only 20 feet wide. And if, if you want to KO the river walk in its entirety, that's a whole other story. But otherwise, that's the road work you're working with, with potentially 12 or perhaps 20 story high rises. Going further down, I believe this is what uh, Commissioner uh, Gonzalez Moore was concerned about. This is at 3rd Avenue as you're heading southbound. The right, there's 3rd Avenue, and then the road does this little turn. Um, folks up north used to call this a drunk trap. Under normal circumstances, this is a very dangerous intersection, and it was probably done to control traffic speeds. But when you put that many units online right next to this, this is gonna be a safety hazard. Imagine an ambulance trying to get in and out of this area. It's a half a mile from Manti Memorial. It should be a piece of cake getting, getting somebody in and out of there. But with this, all bets are off. With all that additional traffic, it's, it's not a gimme. You're gonna have a considerable public safety hazard if you up them. <coughs> also, here's Third Avenue. Um, as apparently I was not aware, um, the petitioner is uh, acquiring lens roofing, but there are still a number of other businesses that are using this very narrow road. It's a one and a half lane bridge going over the creek. And it, it hooks up with 7th. There are restaurants on 7th. There are other services. There's some nonprofits, um, you know, with thrift stores. There's a, lot of trend, there's a lot of traffic on this road. Caddy's blocked off the access to it because they have their dry dock, but prior to that, that used to be a major thoroughfare as well. Mm -hmm. You put this many units, you start putting you know, 12 or more story houses online along this narrow road, this other one, they can promise you they're gonna improve the infrastructure. But like this, the discussion y'all had regarding the pinball facility, once you give somebody a vested right, it's vested, it's done. And then you're crossing your fingers and hoping they keep their word. Think about what you're gonna do to this community. Think about what you're gonna do to public safety. They can do an awful lot with six stories. There's no reason why you have to approve this, and I think it's in the best interest of our community to think about that. Not just in the immediate area of Ward 4, but also adjacent areas like Ward 5 that will be impacted as people from Ward 5 try to access the Riverwalk coming up through this area with all this congestion. It's gonna be a nightmare, so please reconsider this. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mm -hmm. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak on their public comment? Hearing none, we'll close the public comment and um, the applicant. Just a couple of things, just as a reminder that the bulk of the property is already T5, so adding the small strip does not completely change the complexion of, of what's on third already. That, that butts T5 already. Um, and as far as vacating, you know, words do matter uh, when you talk about things. Yes, I talked to, to Mr. Sanders about that years ago. It's not vacation, because vacation is not real. No, no developer wants that land for their use. Potentially abandoning that from the city's perspective and making that, because you have 60 feet down there, making Riverwalk 60 feet wider than it is, making it pedestrian only. Back in the day when those were single family homes, you need to retain Riverside Drive East as an access for those homes. If you don't have those homes on the front that don't require the Riverside Drive East access, because the one that's owned separately has access off of 10th or 11th, whatever it is, you have the abilities to make Riverwalk probably 100 feet across there and make it true a pedestrian experience instead of 20 feet with a sidewalk. That's what was talked about, that's what was meant. Not vacating it in favor of property owners, it is to abandon it and expand your potential river walk down there. So thank you. And again, I think one of the things that I mentioned to you, please, we'll have a disruption in the audience. I've had time to talk. Ms. Moore, we talked about that access, and I think that uh, one of the things to me is, is getting the access all the way from downtown to stay on that opportunity. And this gives us that better time to do it. Now, obviously, like you said, you know, we talk about some of it's gonna to have to be done on our part and making it happen and then working with the developer for the land. But, you know, an ultimate goal of mine 
working with every developer what happens on the caddy's property as well as the other properties to connect it where it's all river walk and some of it may be boardwalk like we had to do in front of the apartment complex but that ultimately makes that part even better for the river walk as well as getting that east west travel through there and um you know so again there is opportunity, I think, to readdress some of that without somebody behind us stopping it that happened. And, you know, you, you can do whatever you want to do and say what you want to say, but you got to tell the truth. And we've told the truth the whole time up here. So, sir, go ahead. <laughs> I, well, if I hear one more disruption in the audience, that person is going to be asked to leave because they've been warned now twice. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come back up. Real quickly, I just wanted to express, your density is in your future land use map. So the zoning request I'm asking for doesn't increase the density, and it's only for a, a small portion of the properties that abut 9th Avenue. What I'm doing is basically within the same future land use district, I'm making the zoning consistent across the whole site that I've purchased at this point so that all of it is under one zoning category as opposed to being in two zoning categories. I also mentioned earlier, and you guys have discussed, Third Avenue. Third Avenue is too narrow. I'll be the first person in the world to admit it. And it may be one of the potential areas where you can bring the river walk through and turn it either down to the water when you get to my properties or bring it on over to Ninth Avenue, depending on what you guys would choose to do. But I am willing, as a property owner, and if I end up with all the properties along 3rd Avenue, I'd be more than happy to work with the city to make this more connected. Connectivity helps bring people to an area. It also helps get people out of the area. And so when I look at what I'm, what I'm proposing to do, it, it's consistent with what's to the east of me, and it's going to be consistent with what you guys end up doing at Caddy's or Tarpon Point. The densities over there are higher than mine. And what I'm looking at right now with what I'm trying to do, you know, it, it's not a 12-story building. I mean, the economics of that, and you've got people sitting in your audience, you could ask about that, would make no sense for the size of this, this property. So what we're looking at is really just creating a consistent zoning across the property. Yes, it may help me with the building envelope a little bit, but I'm not looking to go 12 stories. I don't think any developer out there would look at doing a 12-story building in this area. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. So when you talk about working with you guys, one of the reasons why I purchased the property that's on Ninth Avenue on the west side closest to the ponds. Ninth Street. This, this property right here. One of the reasons why I purchased that property was to help give the connectivity you guys are discussing. Down, down. So. Yeah, could you yeah, it's, it's shrink it a tiny bit? Zoom out. Okay. So this little property right here, mm -hmm. the reason, one of the reasons why I purchased that was to help you guys with your connectivity. I got the oppor opportunity to purchase it, so I, I did it for a benefit for me to work with you guys. But at the same time, it gives you the connection that you really need or are looking for. So thank you. further questions I'd like a clarification okay. Ms. Barnaby. I'd like a clarification either Miss Singer or Miss Shender Wolf I and I think Miss Shender Wolf you were the one that said that the decision that we made several months ago to place a density bonus on certain parcels in downtown that had been fallow for some time um, I, I I thought I heard you say that this that that this property is not included with that. That's not part of it. Correct. Yeah, that it's a height a time limited height incentive bonus and it does not apply to this area. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Moore. Um at after I mean Miss Shindelwolf just I'm sorry, make you sit back down, but could you just again clarify the maximum height then just for the purposes of clarity um, so maximum height with all of the bonuses fulfilled in t5 um, is sorry I want to look at the chart to be sure um, is 12 stories if they fulfill all of the bonuses um, pre bonus height is two to five 
Thank you. And remind us of what those bonuses are. Um, so in the T5 district, if they seek lead, if they receive LEED certification, which is a green building certification or equivalent um, to LEED, then they can receive four additional stories. If 25% of the building square footage is dedicated as workforce housing units, they can receive two stories. If they contribute 0.75% of the overall construction value, um, either as a piece of artwork or to our public art fund, they can receive one story. So I mean, a lot of restrictions that we see that people aren't using. Right. And, and so, um, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I just, to recap, uh, where I'm, you know, my position at this point is my previous comments are pretty much in line with what I'm going to say now. Uh, this, I think that this is the future of this area. I think that it will benefit not only this area, but the city um, by extension of ex helping the downtown core and then, you know, parceling its way out to ultimately benefit the whole city. Um, my main concern as before is just the safety of that corner where 9th meets Riverside because Mr. Grievous's comments and pictures are at, at, in my opinion accurate representations of what is currently there um, that set you know so my same call to a commitment for us to just make sure that our our decisions going forward are in line with making sure that we address that with relative government speed would be my my request of my council members um, and um, and and I sit you know I stick to that to Miss Coachman's point, you know, there is an element of trust. I am aware that this is a yes or no answer and that I have no right to ask the applicant to do anything. That said, I also believe that um, sometimes in a negotiation, you have to give a little to get a little. And I am willing to trust my council members as well as the applicant to make good on that promise and work with us because outside of this issue before us, it is on my list of things to do for us to address what I also consider to be a safety issue that the Riverwalk forces you out if you're a pedestrian or on a bicycle onto Manatee Avenue on that little jog. And it has always been a disappointment to me that we can't figure out another way to have connectivity. My hope with this Third Avenue comment is that we can find a way to not only remove traffic to the extent that we can, from that ninth meeting Riverside for the purposes of safety there, especially with now a potential uh, commercial establishment being there, as well as alleviating traffic in that area, as well as the safety of, again, connectivity outside of Manatee Avenue. Um, so that's pretty uh, much I, where I'm at. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of make a couple comments to what you said as well. They've, they've already said it, stated it on the public record, so we obviously have that as well. Then we also do, you know, we may lose some of our rights by voting for this, but there may be some incentives and some uh, negotiations, as you called it, that we work together to get things, you know, roadways that we might work with in helping get them something that's gonna get us something. So. We don't lose all of our negotiating power through this. So, you know, even though we lose that first part of the, but we don't lose it all. Mr. Perry. Mayor, to add to uh, <coughs> Councilwoman <coughs> Gonzalez Moore and, and your comments, I, I think it's actually an opportunity when you have a consolidated landowner with this much land, because what, what we're talking about today is zoning. And, and that's entitlement to use and certain restrictions. But all of this property would, would likely have to be resubmitted um, for approval through our engineering department um, and public works. So when we talk about aged infrastructure, there will be discussions about what types of infrastructure needs to go there in terms of water supply and distribution, in terms of sewer improvements, uh, collection, potential lift stations, um, in Storm terms water. of stormwater. Additionally, when we talk about traffic safety, that has to be included in that as well. And so if we have the opportunity with a consolidated landowner that owns a wide swatch of the land, there could be a dedication of that land to public right of way to widen a road that you couldn't do otherwise. Um, all of that will be submitted into the overall master planning, I'm sure, when you have a consolidated landowner 
that's looking at something of a planned development, so to speak. That should be very beneficial to give the city leverage and opportunity to solve some of these problems and to share in the cost, uh, have another cost partner in some of this. And it will all be subject to the SIP improvement plan. Um, it, it runs the gamut of emergency equipment coming in there. We heard some comments about mm -hmm. how does an ambulance get down there? Look at the narrowness of the road. Good point. Um, we write to spec for street access depending on use and other factors in our SIP. Uh, police access, same thing. Obviously, the issue that kind of become contentious about a dedication and, and as you pointed out, the opportunity to widen the, 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 the um, river walk itself in certain areas. So we got a real, real I, I think this glass is half full, way more than half full actually, yeah, half empty, I, I, as it relates to future development in alignment with policy decisions of future growth that you all want to see a more robust, improved, uh, utilized, uh, amenitized Riverwalk. And I think one of the opportunities when we were building that part of Riverwalk was that we didn't own land outside of our boundaries on that road, the right of way. So we had to make a road system that gave enough of a walking area to be safe. We had to leave some parking on the sides of the road that didn't do it. And we were also concerned about the speed of the traffic, which Everything you look at through the MPO now and talking about safety and all of that is the narrowing of neighborhood roads to slow people down. But in one way, that does then hinder maybe an ambulance or a fire truck, but still meets the standards, but doesn't look right. Um, another concern I think that um, the nice lady made was about some issues with people getting around, flooding, stormwater, and all of that. Nobody can, when they build a new development, we know the rules and regulations where they make you build up higher and because of the floodplains and all that, but they cannot, um, what do they call it, Adver, adversar ad, adversarially, get that out, uh, hurt another property. They have to do it. So a lot of times that, that stormwater now that might have been going on to your property, they've got to figure out how to get it to not flow so those are the win-wins that I think, as a community city, we see that we're going to get pump stations. We're going to get things that are going to be fixed. We're going to get it in collaboration. So we do not lose our negotiating power on some things because we can say, well, you're going to have to do this, or we can do this, or we can be partners and do it. And as we talked, public-private partnerships are very important when you're trying to change a neighborhood and and you know, get some 100-year-old pipes that we've heard about that we had nothing to do with fixing them in the last umpteen years, but we're, we're gonna do it. So we've had the, the planning department give us theirs. We've had the, the uh, applicant give theirs. We've had an open public hearing, so at this time the chair will entertain a motion. Okay, I'll uh, make a motion to approve ordinance 4026. Second. Second by Mr. Kramer. We've had plenty of discussion. Any other? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 1. Yes. 2. Yes. 3. Yes. 4. Yes. 5. Yes. Carries 5 to 0. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. The next item on the agenda is the GMP addendum to agreement for CMAR services with NDC construction for the Lecom Park facili facility upgrade. Thank you, Mayor. It please the Council. Um, items 8A is the upgrade for Lecom Park on the approval of the addendum uh, for construction of the uh, PDL player development uh, standards for Major League Baseball. Uh, I think I've explained to you all a little bit about um, how Major League Baseball has taken over both minor league and, of course, we do ma Major League Spring training there. Uh, they've implemented additional standards on facilities uh, that require certain things like uh, 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 umpires direct access to the field and um, uh, changing rooms for them. 
women's locker rooms for officials, coaches, other folks that may fall into that gender category, um, the commissary, the weight room. What this project is is approximately 3,200 square feet, and we will build an additional structure um, with NDC as the contractor on this pursuant to a continuing services agreement that is below the CCNA limit um, considerably. The proposed construction cost for this as a GMP gross maximum pricing is uh, $1,810,000. That includes the fee um, for the management of the CMAR, the construction manager at risk, NDC, as I pointed out. This will be along the left field line right on 9th Street itself. It will extend basically from the existing structure uh, uh, northward. And, and move into that area. You may be familiar with a bus parking area where the, the players' buses come in. That needs to be improved as well. The approximate cost at 3,200 square feet for this is about 500, and uh, I think it's about $570 a square foot. That's pretty good in today's pricing world, particularly for specialty type construction. Um, there's a whole list that's attached to the paperwork associated with the GMP request that outlines um, the, the, the bid prices that were received and the various <coughs> allocation of costs associated with the construction of this type of facility. The project's gone through the purchasing department carefully and it has been reviewed by Conflict Council. Also, this does put one of those phases into then continuing City Park because when City Park is allowed, they will be able to utilize some of this when we have tournaments outside of Major League Baseball, when we're having turn bringing in tournaments, you know, the That's tournament correct. directors and the different people will be able to use that. So it's not just for the Pirates only and, and Marauders. It's right. going to be also be able to utilize for the city, but it's that phase that goes into the next phase of the third field. Right, and it kind of goes into play where the pros play. Right. Uh, you know, if a tournament was to, to, to occur there um, as a, a travel baseball sports tourism type event, which we want to uh, uh, encourage and, and kind of develop, um, they would have access to these facilities as well. And that would um, be a selling yeah, point a, to a, the tournament. A very high selling point. And let me just uh, – the, the final point that I didn't bring up initially was the, the source of the funding itself. As you are familiar, uh, we received a $5 million appropriation through the county um, that we executed an intergovernmental agreement with, and that provided for, I believe it was $1.66 million um, per year over a three-year period. About 75 to 80 percent of the funding of this 1.8 million will come from that appropriation. Um, it was agreed to with the county in the in, in, in the interlocal government agreement that the funds could be used for improvements to existing LECOM as well as City Park, and and it's over the three years we're within that window. Um, so we will use a variety, a, a small portion of city money to do this. But as I said, 75 to 80 percent, maybe 82 percent, would be the county's uh, appropriation funding. And that's through the tourist development. It is through the TDC, absolutely. Yep. All right. And, so and, and, and the nine and three Pittsburgh Pirates, of course, just yeah, concluded. Place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And having a good season, and uh, we were all coming out of spring training, Go and, and, and see the economic now. impact of it, and 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 the, the the quality of life improvements, and having professional sports in the community, and things like that. Yep. And they drew over ninety-four thousand people this spring, which was, uh, I think, in the top five, six maybe that we've ever drawn, and. And you, th you see the excitement of what's happening around. Um, any questions for Mr. Perry? No. Chair, will entertain a motion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Barnaby. I'll move for approval of the guaranteed maximum price addendum to the agreement for CMAR services with NDC construction for LECOM Park facility upgrade. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Coachman. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll start the vote in Ward 2. Yes. Three? Yes. Four? Yes. Five? Yes. One? Yes. Approved five to zero. Thank you very much. I don't have anything else uh, under new business. I do want to express my appreciation for all the counselors meeting with me, uh, as we always do before the council meeting and discussing um, action items and, and, and other issues. Thank you. Mr. Perry, while you're up there real yes, quick, um, <clears throat> one of the things I, I want to bring up, I know we're talking about guaranteed maximum price and we're going through some things. and. We're going to be having some more things coming up as we go forward. Um, 
We know there's long lead times on items, and I hope Mr. Allen will listen to this, um, <laughs> possibly, and others out there, but there's long lead time on items that we are finding that are slowing some of our projects because they're getting the construction done, but we're waiting for a switch gear that we heard the other day that could be February 28. Well, we think, well, February of 28, 2025. Well, no, it was February 28, and we cannot be doing that. So I, I'm going to ask you, and I just want the council to hear it since we can't talk publicly about certain things, that there may be some projects that we need to look at some of those items that if we want to be able to get a project done, how do we get those long lead items ordered in a timely manner as we're going through all the process? Sure. So I'm not saying that we're asking for anything today, but I was very disappointed the other day in the contractor that wasn't NDC, but that now all of a sudden they're telling us that a project that we thought would be done in two months could be four years in that scenario, but or next year, and it just doesn't work. So I just think we need to really work that. Yeah, we have several major construction projects uh, that you're familiar with, uh, the public safety projects themselves, fire police, um, PSOC that's going on, LECOM that we talked about, other, uh, other types of activities on the board. And in today's supply chain world, um, things come up, particularly with electronic components right now. I think a few, a year ago it was concrete or so, it was pretty problematic, things like that. So the best thing you can do, I think, working with your contractor or CMAR or whatever, um, is to, and your architect and engineers, is to potentially pre-purchase those. One of the problems is, is that until there's an overall CMAR right. assigned with a GMP, there's a reluctancy for you know a, a CMAR contractor to do that. And so in some cases, we can pre-purchase those items. I think we will be looking at doing that with some of the facilities that uh, we have on the board right now and into the future, because it saves us in two ways. It saves us the commodity of time that doesn't delay the project, but it also could conceivably save us the sales tax associated with that. The upgrades to the uh, Moscow lighting at LECOM were approximately $800,000, and at 7%, you know, that represented about $50,000 savings. Uh, and 50000 out of $800,000 cost is pretty significant. Right. I think it's about 12.5%. And, and that would be something that I would be interested to hear. Don't look um, and maybe Mr. Rudisell or maybe, you know, a, a contractor in the audience could tell us that if there's products that we do say we order and they're two years out and all of a sudden something changed with that product, is there a way that sometimes that said, okay, Never mind, we don't need that, or you know, we're pretty confident because we know with our fire truck, we ordered it two years out, and they didn't require any money up front, but the fire trucks go, and until it's in production, you know, because a lot of times it's not them starting to build it today, it's just getting in the line of production that might not be for six months, but we want to get in that line, mm -hmm. so we're the next one up. So there may be ways to say, hey, we can do this, it's not a big monetary thing up front, but it's at least getting us in the line. So yeah, Mr. Allen, do you have a comment to that? And we'll be talking further about purchasing department too, if we have to have a modification right. potentially to accommodate the, those type of economic right, thing. But because but, we do not want to get a building done and then have to wait two years because the one last product isn't there. Absolutely. Um, under the CMAR, and, and one of the things Rob pushed us really hard on the police station is two things. One is making sure the design team and the CMAR are both looking at what those materials are that might be a problem um, and see if there's alternatives to that to cut that time down. The second is on the police station, we just received our... Um, what we'll call an early GMP package from the architect and engineers that we are pricing right now. And we'll be coming back to you while they're finishing the drawings. We'll come back to you with that early GMP, which includes in the big number, there, there's a couple things. There's elevators, um, 
uh, switch gear and generators right now are the three probably top prime things. So the architect has designed a package that they've sent out specifically for it at Mr. Perry's request for us to do an early GMP package so that we won't be impeded by that time frame as they're finishing the drawing. So I just wanted to give you that quick update. Thank you. Thank you. And I just also pointed out on, on this project in LECOM, we did, we did about three different phases of value engineering with our contractor. I'm sorry. On the LECOM um, upgrade project, we, did, we went through about three different uh, phases of value engineering to get the price to where uh, we thought it should be. And I appreciate the team um, that, that was involved from our CMAR on this and their willingness to um, really put pe you know, pencil to paper and also look at alternatives um, that could be used to increase the value of the taxpayers, as well as negotiate concessions that basically came out of their own uh, margins on it. So I do appreciate that. All right. Hearing no other unfinished business, we'll go to council reports, Ward 2. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, just want to say that I will be attending the Manatee Chamber of Commerce Young Professionals Award Program this Thursday night coming up. Uh, a young lady that I know and am very proud of is, is one of the nominees, and I look forward to seeing who actually wins that award. Uh, also, just... What was that? It's not me. Okay. Okay. I, it just sounded, we had some sort of feedback. Um, just want to announce that the uh, Manatee Seminole Club will be having its golf tournament on May 17th this year. And if you need any information on it, let me know, please. Uh, Riverview Boulevard, uh, Ms. Claybeck has left, but um, it's, it's the project that just keeps going. But I, I, I think we see the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we have information that will be going out to the, uh, the neighbors along Review Boulevard to let them know what our next steps are and how close we are to getting finished. And then the only other thing I want to bring up is we know that Lewis Park has been very successful. We know that we have a lot of people in the community coming from far and wide to use the first uh, American with Disabilities and Adaptive Playground that exists in the city of Bradenton and in Manatee County. Um, however, we're having some challenges. And the challenges are with, I'm going to say it this way, very well-meaning people who love their dogs a lot. But if you are at Lewis Park, we follow the Manatee County rules and regulations with dogs and dogs in public must be on leash. Lewis Park is not, underline that, not a dog park where dogs are allowed to roam free. They need to be on leash. And at no point in time should any dogs be in the enclosed area with the playground equipment. I think that's, I think I'm pretty clear here. So um, we are working, we will have signs that put it, that are in place to say that. And I'm asking you to be a responsible and respectful pet owner and to take good care of your pet and, al and allow the children to experience the playground without what I've been told happening with large dogs running loose in the enclosed area and frightening the children. Let's not do that. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Barnaby. Just to, to jump on with the young professionals, we will be reading, because this is the 25th year, so we have a proclamation I'll be reading that night at that uh, event, which is exciting because we think about, you know, our chamber is one of the oldest in the, probably the country in what it's done and it started at and uh, some, we know some people that started out as young professionals and now are old professionals. Mr. Kramer. Thank you, sir. I resemble that remark. <laughs> um, am I going to that? I thought I, I had me on the... Yeah, okay, okay, making sure. Um, 
Well, speaking of uh, young professionals and the organizations they represent, um, today was a giving challenge. It ended at noon. I hope everybody was able to get their uh, donations in. Um, I was scrambling to do that myself. Uh, another event coming up on Friday is the Pace Center for Girls Lucky Duck Best Dressed Duck event at Firkins. They partner really well with Firkins. I think the grand prize every year for the uh, Lucky Duck race is a, I think it used to be an actual Jeep or an actual car. Now it's a lease on a Jeep or a car. It's times, of, times are tough. Um, but uh, that's Friday night, so looking forward to attend that. Um, and I thank Mr. Perry for interrupting my vacation. Uh, thankfully, it was near the end of the eclipse, but I was sitting in a farm field up in uh, western Ohio, up a little northwest of Chief Wiesman's neck of the woods, up northwest of Dayton, um, and was there with my wife's family uh, as we were in the path of totality for the total eclipse for four min I'm sorry, three minutes, 58.6 seconds. Appreciate the pictures. And it was pretty wild. I mean, I got to say, I, I tried to send everybody a little video of it. Um, I had multiple cameras going. I'm not sure they all worked well, but I'm still an amateur. But it was, uh, it was just a neat event. Um, one thing from that video I sent you all, if you turn it up, you'll hear, like, little kids screaming because they were freaking out about how cool it was. But, uh, did, did any of the farm animals respond? I'm just uh, I heard birds chirping. Um, the cows, we had, there are two steers in the barn, a couple of uh, goats, but no, actually lambs, lambs, sorry. But no, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Thank you. All right. Ms. Moore. Uh, I was going to mention the giving challenge too, but then when it was past noon, I thought, well, <laughs> there goes that. Good luck. <laughs> Hopefully it all worked out. Um, I, you may already know this, uh, I'm, I imagine that Ms. Coker already knows this, but I was very pleased at Monday's uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council meeting to learn that the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program has joined, has been a, made a part of the uh, Agency on the Bay and Coastal Management. Um, and I know we had had brief discussion when he was here to present about uh, how we wish we were formerly under their tutelage and I think this is another step making that closer you know because of the relevancy of our area so I just thought I would share just in case um, at that same meeting I got they were there was a discussion regarding community engagement and feedback and so I just thought I would know uh, you know for our, as we're talking about having public meetings and whatnot um, and this also ties into uh, ongoing discussions that I've had with Mr. Williams um, which is this that I uh, the importance of um, always being aware and mindful of educating the public about how projects work in their timeline. For example, something that might be in design for a year or so, people don't realize that that's actually just, you know, that means it is actually work being worked on, but you don't see anything until there's five years later, there's going to be, you know, streets torn up and, and construction beginning. Um, to that point, um, this feedback, this person that was talking about community engagement mentioned that some of the feedback, negative feedback that uh, municipalities get is that uh, a citizen will attend a public meeting, express their concerns or their opinions, and then not see anything happen and not realize that that future project is actually tied back to what took place five years ago. So your comment was very on point, I thought, and that we should be mindful about maybe continually making that part of our process so that we can make sure that people realize that even though you haven't seen anything happen since the meeting where you might have you know, taken the time to speak or express your opinion, that it is being actually incorporated into the grand scheme of plans and whatnot. Um, and so I'm happy to, uh, along that same vein that the discussions with Mr. Williams have been along the line of keeping us in the know about projects and where they're at in their process so that we can remind folks that stuff hasn't been forgotten as they make um, requests and comments. Um, and then the final thing, and I don't, I might be stealing someone's thunder, but I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Miss Brandy Colonandria. <laughs> okay, great. I was just going to say it was delightful to let me, uh, you know, have my usual uh, geek fest about projects and things I'd like to see in the future, and especially when it comes to infrastructure and public works. So I appreciated that time. And that's it. All right. Okay. I, I, I want to kind of echo on what you're saying about 
communicating with the public because they do lose sight. If they don't see something happening, they visually see it in their front yard or backyard. They think nothing's going on and it's super important to keep them informed and keep us informed. I was just looking at an email that I received from Ms. Clayback a while back and it was telling me about the projects going on in Ward 5. So I would definitely like to be updated on those kinds of things because I forget too, I lose sight. So it would be great if we could really like work towards that. I've actually seen some uh, elected officials that put out newsletters, electronic newsletters. I've always wanted to start something like that, but I'm not as tech savvy and someone wanted to charge me a lot of money a month to do it, so it's not been done. But all that also brings into mind that there is a postcard going around, you know, at that vision, visionary project that we're going on, so I just hope that people are aware of it. And um, it, it reads, we want to hear from you, and there's the QR code and all of that good stuff. So I hope it's circulating. I had a few, I've put them out uh, among uh, Ward 5, so. Definitely want to hear from the public. Uh, the Marauders are at the bat. At the bat. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I like that evening games because then I, it's a good chance I'll get to attend them. Other than that, War 5 is alive. Thank you. Ms. Coker. Yeah, um, I was going to definitely congratulate the mayor on throwing that strike at the opening night. At the Marauders game. I mean, we've come a long way from the bounce. <laughs> well, that's just after surgery. That's true. <laughs> now I'm out of surgery. That shoulder. But um, I would like to encourage everybody to check their schedule. And also, we're, and I probably want to give uh, Councilwoman Bar Barnaby an opportunity. I think there are some special Fridays coming up. Isn't yours one of the first ones? Friendly City Friday. Friendly City Friday. Oh yes, we're 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 going to be saluting women in sports. And when is that coming up? That is April. You should have warned me ahead of time. Sorry, that's I, okay. I was. That's I, all right. I, it is April the nineteenth. So that's soon. And I know uh, I'm going to be doing um, family faith and family night in May. So um, just start checking this the calendar and watching out for their schedule. Also, um, the music in the park um, this Friday is Sweet Fleet. It's a Fleetwood Mac uh, cover band. So um, I heard them at the regatta in the rain. <laughs> they were awesome. So I'm anxious to see them. That's this Friday on the Riverwalk at 6 o'clock. And uh, also, um, on the 24th, which is the day of our next meeting, the Kiwanis Club is going to be cutting the ribbon on their all-inclusive playground, which I, some of the pictures I've seen, it's just going to be wonderful. Um, and the, uh, the Inspire, you know, it's going to be inspiring. And the Kiwanis Penguin Project, those uh, performers are going to be there giving us a little sneak peek of their performance. I think it's going to be a great day. It's at 10 a.m. Our council meeting is that day. I don't know if, if I'm going to be able to make it, but... Um, Anyhow, I just want to tell everybody, uh, it's at Tom Bennett Park. It's going to be a wonderful um, grand opening. So, Thank you. So just kind of echo everybody's comments because it's all in your wards and different areas, but throughout the whole city. Um, I think we're lucky to have the Marauders. So some of the stuff that we do, obviously, at the ballpark is to continue that great part of it and then obviously flowing into spring training and then tournament baseball as we get the third field is, is something very good. And, and um, I was lucky enough to throw out the first pitch, which was the best one I think I've ever done in that atmosphere. But we had somebody that sang the national anthem oh, that I think God. is yeah. unbelievable. And then we also had our color guard from our police department, you know, present the colors that day. So it's always the opening day theme that, you know, they're celebrating our city with having that. And um, with, with Craig, the general manager of the Marauders, Rzeka, which obviously is one of the, the top stars aging out of the young professionals for the chamber and what he's doing. But Craig has really tried to mobilize the engagement of the Marauders and, and doing the Friendly City Friday Nights where it's a themed for each council person, something that meant something maybe in their life or, or history, as well as doing the 941 
obviously $9.41. I think you can get a beverage, a hot dog, and get in the game. So there's a lot of different opportunities to go see some minor league baseball and enjoy something in the town that really doesn't cost you a lot. So those are things that, that you know, just a small portion of it. And, you know, before you go there, maybe go to the Village of the Arts have some fun, you know, walk our river walk or do mm -hmm. something. But now all those exciting things. So at this time, though, I would like to bring up. Or take a freebie. If or you take can. a freebie. So, um, Mr. Williams, would you like to come up and introduce somebody to us? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, what I, who I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Brandy Col Colandrea. Yeah, I've probably been practicing. So, um, Brandy is our new Deputy uh, Public Works Director. Um, so she will work with uh, Mr. Lee, who you uh, you know we kind of pat introduced earlier. Um, but Brandy brings a wealth of knowledge in business processes, um, financing. Um, SOPs really um, will be a great complimentary partner in, uh, in bringing our public works level uh, up, up a grade and a, a couple steps to, to bring us into the new age. So I'd like to introduce you to Brandy. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon now. Good Thank you. Now, so. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to getting to work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank she says she does a lot of things well, and I checked her out. A lot of people said that she does, but she says I'm not a good public speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll teach you how to be. Yeah. I'm a support service behind the scenes kind of girl. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, Brandy came from Pinellas County and worked with St. Petersburg and career service employee. Um, Going to be a tremendous asset to work under the overall leadership, and uh, we'll be rolling out some of our realignments that are based on metric uh, the matrix report and some of the things that we've talked to council about um letitia smith is here has done a great job recent addition to us about a year ago in the utility side but we're going to do some realignments and we're going to really focus on infrastructure we're going to focus on infrastructure planning long term um, technical services we're going to the engineering uh the the maintenance and and operations of traditional public works and the projects we have to do the utility um, repair replacement rebuilds that have to be done both from a perspective of uh, water um, fresh water treatment potable water treatment that we have an obligation to deliver to our to, to the high quality water at a reasonable cost in a reliable manner um, as well as the whole wastewater issue that has come up we've got a lot of work to do ahead of us and Brandy's going to be really good, I think, at organizing and advancing that work in a lot of different ways that you all may or may not see. Ultimately, you'll see it through your constituents and your wards, but it's our job to get it done. And, and I think we're all trying to step up. The good employees that have been there for a long time um, that, that are in the trenches and do the work, the management team over there of superintendents and supervisors we got some very talented people and our executive management team um, that are section you know that, that, that are going to be basically assistant directors of of utilities of maintenance and operation um, pub, traditional public works of engineering of vertical construction services the facility piece and the like so you're going to see a lot of a lot of cha not changes but improvements I think and formalization and ultimately, that'll lead to much more um, uh, better control of our assets that that are literally probably in you know over a billion dollars in overall in infrastructure and the program itself. It's going to be better organized. It's going to deliver to you all what we talked about as it relates to reaching out to the community. So if we had something five years ago, we'll be telling you, oh, it's starting a year from now, and ultimately getting you to do, help you do your jobs with the community and the policy development. I'm really excited about the team we're putting together, and Lance has been doing a great job over there, along with a lot of other people. I really appreciate it. I, I, I just couldn't tell you what I'd do without Lance. Yeah. All right. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Yes, wait, we'll have wait. To find out. Vice Mayor Don't Barnaby. Don't go. Don't go. Uh, one of the things that we used to receive, and I don't know if it was on a monthly basis or a bi-weekly basis, was a report from Public Works where 
there was the projects were listed and then if there was action taken or if there was um, yeah that sort of thing if we could get back to something like that I think it would be very helpful yeah. that is one of the one of the things that we're going to focus on Brandy and I are going to focus on is being able to provide a, a, a monthly um, or even you know it, we'll, we'll, depend, we'll determine the schedule but a report of overall projects but then ones that are specific to each council ward as well um, because to, to Councilwoman Morris' point, and we've talked about this as she mentioned uh, multiple times, there's a lot of work that's done ahead of schedule that people just don't see. And so when they think, well, you know, when is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? Every council person will have talking points to be able to say this is the status of the project. You'll know what's available in your ward, but then you'll also have the information for just generally throughout the city. So the idea is better communication for between the department and our council but then also ultimately to all the citizens as well and we'll incorporate our communications team to have website information and, and instead of being reactive with everything we want to be a little more proactive um, so we can get that information out so we'll work on that quickly yes miss coker well i was to that end at one time and it may not even be feasible but um, the county has their website where you can go on and you can pull up any project and know exactly where it's at. And there was, is there any way to work with that? We're working with that right now, uh, Counselor, with our communications team. Uh, Tiffany Shattuck and David Myers have been working on that. They've been doing a great job, too. We're up in that game, and we will get that on, you know, the county has, I think, the big six is type yeah. of thing, which deals with, you know, different subjects, transportation and the like. We, we, we're pretty close to getting something out on that I front just hate too. to reinvent the wheel if yeah. they've already got it, right. which they had. Our wheel's a little good. bit different, but it, it, it's the same, you know, it's, it, it's a wheel. Okay. And so we'll be kind of doing the same thing. Good. Yeah. And, and just so you know, not to put any pressure on Brady, but one of our long-term goals is to get our public works division uh, accredited. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, we're lucky enough with Brandy that she had experience in going from non, no accreditation at all to getting a, a, a division accredited and then in a different world maintaining that accreditation. So when that, we talk about up in, our, up in the game of the city, and, and that's one of the things that we're looking for long term um, that will really, we think, not only give our, our citizens a little more comfort, but also give our employees a little more pride in what they're doing and they'll understand what their part is to the entire picture. And so, uh, good luck. Awesome. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I think that's important as we go forward to really try to figure out what logistics, where we were, where we are, and what we can be for the future because of communication. And, you know, there's so many different ways to communicate that I think some of them get lost. And if you're not in that one communication circle, you think it's not happening. In reality, it is. And, and um, we had a kind of a breakout meeting yesterday about our events around the city with the, the group that's been doing it this year. And uh, you know, I mentioned to him that some of us feel that we didn't see it as much around, but you know, we were still having the success of the people showing up, so somehow it's getting out there. But it's how we combine those communications to get together because it the communication's out there it's just if, if you're not on that specific platform and what is the right platform I mean there's a lot of stuff that's going on in those different type of arenas that that hurt so um, any department heads that have anything specific Miss Singer Um, we're at over 600 responses on the online survey, so uh, that's due in part to the work that you all have been doing in passing out the postcards. We do have them in Spanish now as well, so we're going to distribute that to certain centers uh, to get the word out to uh, the rest of the community and make sure that we maximize that response. I think we have about another week to go uh, with the survey, so we want to button that up. 17th, correct? Yeah. Yep. And it did hit the chamber group today. It yeah. just came out, so and we think the chamber will get it. And it was emailed to all of the Manatee County School District mm -hmm. employees yes. as well. Right. And I mean, ultimately, the goal was to get at least 800, 
to have sort of it. Now, if we're over 600, I think getting to the chamber and the school district hopefully will get us to that point. All right, perfect. Thank you. Good job, Robert. All right, anything else? We'll be adjourned. Thank you.